Ads heard during the podcast that are not in my voice are placed by third-party agencies outside of my control and should not imply an endorsement by Weird Darkness or myself. The Black Museum. Its affiliated stations present Escape. All of fantasy. In a sanctum mystery. Lights out. Welcome, Weirdos! I'm Darren Marlar, and this is Weird Darkness's Retro Radio. Here I have the privilege of bringing you some of the best dark, creepy, and macabre old-time radio shows ever created. If you're new here, welcome to the show. While you're listening, be sure to check out WeirdDarkness.com for merchandise, sign up for my free newsletter, connect with me on social media, listen to free audiobooks I've narrated, visit other podcasts that I produce. You can also visit the Hope in the Darkness page if you're struggling with depression, dark thoughts, or addiction. You can find all of that and more at WeirdDarkness.com. Now, bolt your doors, lock your windows, turn off your lights, and come with me into Weird Darkness's Retro Radio. The CBS Radio Mystery Theater presents... Come in. Welcome. I'm E.G. Marshall. Do you like riddles? Of course you do. Give me a good riddle that seems to defy solution and I'll settle down happily to unravel it like, uh, well, like a, a cat with a ball of twine. And like the cat, I usually succeed in making a tangled mess of it. But untangling a mystery, finding the answer to the riddle is fun. Unless, of course, you happen to be involved in it personally and your life depends on finding a fast solution like Rachel James. Suicide, Lieutenant Forbes. Mr. Carson committed suicide. No, Mrs. James. He was murdered. That's impossible. Why impossible? Because he was the only one in his room. The windows were locked on the inside, and the door was locked on the inside. If Mr. Carson was murdered, how did the murderer escape? Frankly, Mrs. James, I don't know. Well, I do. The answer's obvious. Suicide. Well, the answer is anything but obvious. Because it was murder. Our mystery drama, Key to Murder, was written especially for the Mystery Theater by George Lothar and stars Mercedes McCambridge. It is sponsored in part by Uncle Ben's Long Grain and Wild Rice and Anheuser-Busch Incorporated, Brewers of Budweiser. I'll be back shortly with Act One. I might as well come right out and say it. I'm no Sherlock Holmes. Are you? Well, whether you are or not, here's your chance to match wits with Police Lieutenant Michael Forbes. Mike to you. Luckily, you have nothing to lose. Mike had everything to lose. The life of the woman he had come to love. The story begins in a certain old four-story brownstone in a certain large city on a certain cold and wintry day. In the rather stuffy Victorian living room, Rachel James and her closest friend Minerva Hall are having a much-needed cup of tea. Another cup, Rachel? Oh, I guess so, Minerva. 
Might as well enjoy it while I can still afford it. Oh, come on now. Things aren't that bad. Just because two of your rumors packed up and left. Mm-hmm. Mrs. Parker's making noises about doing the same thing. I don't know that I want to go on living in a boarding house where there's been a suicide. That's what she told me this morning. Uh, it's always darkest before the dawn, Rachel, and Minerva, I... Minerva, please. This is no time for one of your life-can-be-beautiful proverbs. I'm in a real blockbuster of a bind. You know as well as I do that I've gone through an awful lot since I inherited this rooming house from Aunt Hattie. I know it hasn't been easy for you. Easy? What with inflation and taxes and mortgage payments and skyrocketing fuel bills and I don't know what all, I've just barely managed to keep my head above water. And now with two boarders gone, three rooms empty, counting poor Mr. Carson... I don't know how I'll make ends meet. I just don't know. One thing you can do is stop worrying. We'll get by somehow. We? Oui. If worse comes to worse, you can always sell the place. And I have got my job at Gibbon Real Estate. <laughs> don't look at me like that, Rachel. After all, I am your oldest and closest friend. Oh, my dear Minerva, let's face facts. You just get by as it is on what they pay you as a clerk. And there's... Well... I don't like to mention... I know. My mother. If it weren't for you footing the bills, I'd never be able to keep her in that sanitarium in Cleveland. Well, that's another problem to worry about. What happens to her if I go broke? Well, she is really not your responsibility. Oh, but she is. She's your mother. I couldn't let anything happen to her any more than I could let anything happen to you. I... Is that somebody at the door? Maybe someone who wants to rent a room. Yes. Uh, Miss James? Yes. Uh, Lieutenant Mike Forbes, homicide. Lieutenant, homicide? You mean the police? Yes, ma'am. Oh, well, uh, won't you come in? <clears throat> it's a terribly cold day, isn't it? Yeah, cold, windy. I walked over from the precinct station. It was just a couple of blocks. The wind darn near blew this pipe of mine right out of my mouth. <laughs> I see you held on to it. Oh, you object to pipe smoking, Miss James? I mean, if you do... I'll, oh, no, uh... no, that's, uh, quite all right. Well, now, Lieutenant, I have one or two rooms I think you might like. There's one on the fourth floor that's very spacious. It overlooks the garden in the back. It's very quiet. Uh, Miss James, I'm not here to rent a room. I'm investigating the death of Harold Carson. Oh... Will you come into the living room, then? Uh, Minerva, this is Lieutenant Forbes of the police. Uh, my friend, Miss Minerva Hall. How do you do? I do. Won't you sit down, Lieutenant? Oh, thank you. Well, now, uh, you say you're investigating poor Mr. Carson's suicide? Uh, yes, ma'am. The fact of the matter is, it wasn't suicide. Not suicide? No, ma'am. Harold Carson was murdered. Murdered? Oh, but that's not possible. Hmm? Why isn't it? Well, you know how he was found, don't you? I mean, don't the police make out reports and things? Oh, I read the dope sheet, all right. Well, then you know he was found on the floor with his head right next to the gas heater and all the jets turned on full. Yeah, I know, but... Uh... Minerva here and I smelled the gas and we traced it to Mr. Carson's room and we called to him. But he didn't answer, and then we tried to open the door. But it was locked on the inside, so Min and I had to break it in. And thank heaven she was here, because I'd never have been able to do it alone. Yeah, I can imagine. And there I, he uh, was, the poor man. He was dead. A suicide. Ma'am, I, I, I hate to disagree with you, but Mr. Carson was murdered. It looked like suicide, yes, but it was meant to look like suicide. But the autopsy report from the medical examiner's office states that the old man was first rendered unconscious by a blow to the head. And that death by asphyxiation, uh, gas, followed. Someone knocked him out and then turned on the gas? Yes. But he, he, he couldn't have been murdered. If he was, what happened to the murderer? What do you mean? Well, how did he get out of the room? The windows and door were locked. On the inside. No, no, that couldn't be. L Lieutenant, 
The key was in the door lock, on the inside. This is an old brownstone with old doors, the kind that have those big keys, you know. And there's only one key to each room. Uh, you don't have duplicates? No, and even if I or someone did have a duplicate, you can't unlock the door from the outside without pushing the other key out of the lock. We'd have found it on the floor, but not in the lock. Mm-hmm. Mm -hmm. Interesting. Very. Oh, that match. Put it off. Mm, just read lighting. No, pipe. put off the match. Mm -hmm. I smell gas. Or I think I do. Oh, not again. Not again. You're right. I smell it now. It seems to be coming from... Yes, it is. It's from upstairs. All right, here. I'll go first. Oh, if it's another... It isn't. It can't be. Lightning never strikes twice in the same... Oh, man. The smell is strong. Very strong here on the third floor. Yeah. It's coming from this room. Mrs. Parker. Open up. Open up in there. Break it in. Break it in. <coughs> Mrs. Parker. Oh, Mrs. Parker. No. Oh, no. Open the window. Let me. <coughs> Lock from the inside. <coughs> Door locked on the inside, too. Key in the lock. Mrs. Parker. Oh, let's get her to the window. Fresh air. No, no. Don't bother She's dead. But maybe if we can get some air into her lungs... It won't cure a broken neck. <gasps> broken? You can see the way it's twisted, Miss Hall. It's broken, all right. Then she's been murdered, too. Yes, Miss James. She's been murdered, too. Hello? Oh, uh, yes. Uh, uh, just a minute. It's for you, Lieutenant. Oh, thank you, Miss James. You? Well, I've questioned all but one border, Inspector Morris. A guy named Whitman. No, no, no. I'll, I'll stick here. It's just five o'clock, and Miss James says he gets home promptly at five every day. Yeah, well, okay. Okay, I'll see you in your office. You look pretty beat, Miss James. Why don't you go to uh, lie down for a while? No, it isn't rest I need, Lieutenant. It's just a little peace of mind. Yeah, I guess so. Two murders in your house in less than 36 hours. And a wrecked livelihood. Two more boarders, after you questioned them, told me that they were moving out. And nobody is going to move in. You can be sure of that. Things kind of rough, huh? Oh, you don't know the half of it. Mm-hmm. I haven't seen your husband around. You a uh, widow, maybe? I'm divorced. Oh, I'm sorry. No, you needn't be. He was a drunk. I put up with that for years. I would have gone on, I guess, except that uh, he started to cheat on me. There was another woman. I never found out who she was, but I... Oh, I... Yes, this is Whitman, huh? Yes, yes, it is. Uh, uh, Mr. Whitman, uh, will you come in here, please? If it's uh, about the rent, Mrs. James... Uh, oh, I, I didn't know anybody else was here. No, it's not about the rent, Mr. Whitman. Uh, this is Lieutenant Forbes of Homicide. And according to him, Mr. Carson didn't commit suicide. He was murdered. And then just a couple of hours ago... Uh, let me handle this, Miss James. Sit down, Mr. Whitman. John C. Whitman, right? Yeah, but what happened a couple of hours ago? Now I'll ask the question, sir. Well, you don't understand. I'm a newspaper reporter, Daily Globe. Well, not exactly. I want to be a reporter, and I need a break, you know? I keep looking for a break, and if there's been another suicide here, or... or uh, wait, you said murder. There's been another death, yes. Miss James has filled me in on you pretty much, so... Just answer me a couple of questions now, huh? We, sure, sure, sure. You work at the Daily Globe, 8 to 4.30, right? That's right, eight-hour day, half hour for lunch. Yeah. Now, Miss James tells me you always leave promptly at 7.30 in the morning, but today you didn't leave until 1 in the afternoon. Well, uh, yeah, I was sort of off my feet. I called in sick. Now, on the day Mr. Carson met his death, on that day you called in sick too, didn't you? 
Uh, well, uh, he, yeah. Uh, what are you getting at, Lieutenant? Well, just routine questions, Mr. Whitman. Uh, how well do you know Mrs. Parker? Mrs. Parker? Did something happen to her? Is that what this is all about? How well did you know her? Oh, just to say hello to, that's all. How well did you know Mr. Carson? Mm, same. Wish I'd known him better. If I'd known him better, I might have written a story my editor would have printed. But he didn't. Into the scrap basket. Says it wasn't good enough. Uh, mm. Mr. Whitman wrote an account of what happened the other day. Mm, thank you, Miss James. I assumed as much. You're welcome, Lieutenant Forbes. Oh, well, thanks, Mr. Whitman. Yeah, now, about Mrs. Parker. What happened? I could get my teeth into one good story. A scoop, you know. Listen, the city editor would make me a reporter, maybe. So, Mrs. Parker, what happened? Uh, Mrs. James will tell you, or you can read it in the evening edition. One suspect, Lieutenant. Is that all? Yes, Inspector. Whitman. 32 years old. Been in newspaper work since he graduated from journalism school. Dying to be a reporter and hasn't made it all these years. He's hot for a scoop. Well, it struck me he could maybe be making his own scoop. Well, if he made this one, how come he didn't cash in on it? You checked his city editor. He told you Whitman never said a word about Mrs. Parker's murder. Yep. Yeah, well, have a look at this dope sheet. Uh, Harold Carson withdrew his life savings from the bank, $4,300, the day before he was murdered. Ah, uh, read on, Lieutenant. Mrs. Parker withdrew her life savings yesterday. And not a dollar of that money, cold cash, was found in Carson's room or Parker's. You find out who's clever enough to pull this locked door trick. Who was clever enough to get Carson and Parker to withdraw every cent they had in the world. And you'll have your murderer. In fact, I may have your murderer for you. I give... Rachel James. Mrs. Rachel James. <laughs> no. No, not her. Listen, Inspector, she's one of the nicest women I've ever met. She's also a convicted felon, Lieutenant. What? Back in 65, she served six months for theft. <laughs> on Lieutenant Mike Forbes' face reveals not only shock, but something else. And I don't know what it is myself. Maybe... Well, no. It couldn't be that. He's only known Rachel James a few hours at most. And I... Well, I have never believed much in love at first sight. I don't know. Maybe we'll find out when I return for Act Two. does a murderer, or anyone else if it comes to that, get out of a room when all exits, windows and doors, have been locked from inside? Impossible? No. After all, whoever murdered old Harold Carson and Mrs. Parker and tried to make their deaths look like suicide must have accomplished what only seems impossible. Up to this point, I've been unable to figure it out, and perhaps you have too. So... Let's join Lieutenant Mike Forbes in the living room of that old four-story brownstone as he tries getting to the bottom of things. Lieutenant, are you accusing me of murdering Mr. Carson and Mrs. Parker? No, Mrs. James. Then why did you come here to ask her if she'd ever been convicted of theft? Now, Miss Hall, if you don't mind, I'd like to talk with Mrs. James alone. I do mind. Rachel's my friend, my inseparable friend. Whatever you have to say, you can say in front of me. Do as he says, ma'am. I'll be all right. Well, if you need me, I won't be far off. Hey, Miss James, I'm sorry if I'm causing you an embarrassment, but two murders have been committed in this house, and I've got to get at the truth of things. I'm ruined, Lieutenant. That bad? It couldn't be worse. I'm afraid I'm going to have to sell, whether I want to or not. Well, at least you'd get a good price. Land values in this area are high. 
Gone up, too, since they built that office complex and shopping mall over on 8th. Yeah, but, uh, look, I've, I've got to ask you these questions, Miss James, and it'll be in your best interest to answer them. Uh, now then, you did serve a six-month sentence for theft, didn't you? Yes. And I suppose that, uh, makes me a murder suspect right there. Oh, no, 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 no. I, I just have to check out everybody's all. Now, about that theft. Were you guilty? No. Was Miss Hall? No. But it could have looked as if she was. And, and, and... Oh. You know. You've known all along. Well, like I said, I've been checking. Well, if you knew, why did you bother to ask? To see how you'd react? Hmm. You reacted fine. Well, thank you. I, I'm sorry. I didn't mean to offend you. I, getting back to the theft, your friend Miss Hall... Well, her boss had given her $900 in cash to put in the bank. Is that right? Well, never mind. I know it's right. You came to the office to go to lunch with her and waited for her at her desk while she was in the ladies' room. When she came back, she opened her desk drawer to get the envelope with the money in it, and it was gone. Now, you just told me you weren't guilty. If that's so, why'd you plead guilty? Well, why? To protect me, Lieutenant. Yes, I've been listening outside the door just in case you got too rough with Rachel. Oh, Min. You might as well know, Lieutenant. You probably know anyway. I stole that money. Min! No, it's got to come out now. My mother came down ill, very ill, and I needed money. When my boss gave me that $900, well... The temptation was too big for me. It was a, a stupid thing to do, especially since I was sure to be suspected, as I was. But that's when when this, this wonderful woman here stepped forward and said that she'd done it. Well, you had to be with your mother. She needed you. And I was divorced and living alone. Oh, you sacrificed yourself for me, Rachel. And I'll never forget it. Someday I'll get the chance to repay you. Yeah, well, I'll uh, move along now. And thank you for being so frank and open with me about the theft of that money. You knew anyway. No. No, Miss Hall. I didn't know. Then as I see it, Lieutenant, you've got three suspects now. Uh, three, Inspector? Jack Whitman, Minerva Hall, Rachel James. Rachel, uh... Miss James, you can eliminate her. She didn't do it. Well, you seem awfully sure of that. What makes you so sure? Why, I, I, well, I, I just can't imagine her killing anyone. No, she's, she's a very decent sort. Generous, sympathetic. Well, anyhow, that's the picture I get from the boarders I talk to and my own observation. Attractive to whom? Meaning what, Inspector? Well, don't let any interest you may be developing in Rachel James put blinders on you. Now, about this Miss Hall, this close friend of Mrs. James, you say she admitted stealing that $900 and letting Mrs. James take the rap for her? Yeah, but she's no common thief, Inspector. Oh, it's the Whitman guy who interests me. I talked to his editor at the Daily Globe... Seems Whitman has been knocking himself out to get to be a reporter for years, but just hasn't got what it takes. He fools himself into thinking all he needs is a break. And you figure maybe he's making his own breaks with these murders. That could be. The more I think about it, Lieutenant, the more it seems to me cracking this case depends on finding the answer to those locked rooms. I couldn't agree more. I checked the doors and the windows. They're solid. No gimmicks. <laughs> you laugh, but I even check for secret panels. <laughs> yeah, well, it's an old brownstone, you know. You never know what you might find, but no dice. Well, keep after it. There's an answer. Find it. Yeah. I got a feeling I 
Better find it fast. Why? I don't know. Just one of those feelings you get. Feeling that tells me there could be another murder. Rachel, this is Mr. Gibbon. Arthur Gibbon, my boss. Mr. Gibbon, Rachel James. Oh, it's a pleasure, Miss James. Oh, won't you sit down, Mr. Gibbon? Uh, thank you. Well, uh, Miss Hall has told me of your situation here. Says that you talked to her about selling your house. And as I understand it, uh, two murders have been committed in this house. Most of your boarders have moved out because of them. And... Well, the house has gotten itself a bad name. Hmm? That's unfortunate. It's most unfortunate. Brings its value down, you know. Yes, I guess so. Hmm. Uh, tell me, Miss James, uh, you any idea what your house is worth? Well, uh, no, not really. I was thinking you might make me an offer. Well, yes, yes, I could, I could. Uh... Under the circumstances, the best I can do, is the very best, would be $50,000. Oh, you're not serious, Mr. Gibbon. Well, I'm afraid I am. Well, the land alone is worth more than that, much more. Yes, but the bad name... Mr. Gibbon, the house has a bad name, so far as renting rooms to boarders is concerned. But if you are the businessman Minerva's always told me you are... You wouldn't be buying the house. You'd be buying the land to tear the house down and put up an office building or something. Uh, well, yes, that's, that's true enough. But uh, well, the land isn't as valuable as I gather you think it is. And as I understand it, you have no option but to sell. Well, I'm sorry, Mr. Gibbon, but your offer is much too low. I guess the thing for me to do is to, uh, get bids, or whatever they're called, on the property, and, uh, take the highest. Well, it's your house, your land, you can do as you wish. But I ought to tell you, you're making a mistake. As I said, land values are down. So if you change your mind, Mrs. James, you let me know, huh? My offer will still stand. No, 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 that's all right, Minerva, I'll see myself out. Oh, uh, you won't forget about the deeds. The deeds? Yeah, the ones I want to work on tonight. Oh, oh, yeah, those, yes. Well, I'll see you in the office then at seven. At seven. I'll be there. Goodbye, Miss James. I could be wrong, Rachel, but I don't know. $50,000 seems like a good offer to me. No, well, you could be right. But I'll shop around. No. There's no other way, man. Then there's no other way, Art, in the hell with it. No. Well, you listen to me, baby. Oh, no, Art, no. I've gone as far as I'm going to go. This is no time to chicken out. I never bargained for killing Rachel. I didn't either. But how was I to know she isn't the... Naive pushover you told me she was. Oh, it's that police lieutenant Forbes. What do you mean? Well, there's a change in Rachel. A subtle change. I noticed it right after she met Forbes. Well, I still don't get what you... Neither do I. All I know is there's a man in her life again. For the first time in years. Well, all right, all right. So there's a change in her. There's a million dollars no, riding I on it. No, I cannot kill Rachel. Carson and Parker, yes, they meant nothing to me, nothing. I even conned them into taking their life savings out of the bank, the suckers. But to kill Rachel, no, Art, no, I can't do it. You'll do it. You've got to. I won't. You were really enough to wreck a boarding house business. Really enough so I could move in, grab that property for ten cents on the dollar. Taking her money is one thing. Taking her life... No, Art, no. I, I... I guess there's some little spark of decency left in me. <laughs> decency? Uh, you, you can talk about decency? 
conning her all these years, sucking her dry like those monthly handouts to keep your dear mama in a sanitarium? Your dear mama who died years ago? Money's one thing. Money's everything. Without it, you might just as well be dead. Now, you listen. I didn't set this whole thing up. I didn't explain the locked door trick and everything else. A locked door trick that didn't work. The cops found out it was murder, not suicide. Thanks to you, not me. If you'd suffocated Carson and Parker like I told you... I couldn't do it. It was just... It was too horrible that way. Okay, okay. So you bashed one on the skull and broke the neck of the other. Accidentally. Accidentally. Deliberately. You did it. And now you do it to Rachel James. I don't care either. Do it. No. What are you doing? Calling the police. What for? To tip them off on how Carson was murdered. And Parker. No. You're as guilty as I am. Ah, but not as involved. In fact, I'm not involved at all, man. I've seen to that. Give me that one. Yeah. Filthy swine. <laughs> Tonight, man. Killer. Tonight. Well, a spark of decency may still flicker in Minerva Hall's soul, but clearly it's been thoroughly quenched by Mr. Arthur Gibbons. Or has it? We'll see. We'll also see how someone can walk out of a room locked on the inside when I return for Act Three. A strange and baffling thing, human emotion. Even the most skilled psychiatrists, I'm told, have trouble unraveling the tangled skeins of motivation which drive us to do one thing or another. I'm thinking of Minerva Hall, who, though she murdered Mr. Carson and Mrs. Parker, is repelled by the prospect of murdering Rachel James. Makes sense, I guess. After all, they've had a close relationship for years. And as for Rachel, sensing that Mike Forbes is something to lean on, somebody who can give her some protection, perhaps even shield her against a world she's finding it more and more difficult to cope with, well, let's see. Sit down, Lieutenant. Cup of tea. Uh, no, 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 thanks, Miss James. It's a cold day. It's bitter cold. I thought you might like something to warm you up. Well, I, uh, I could use something. (laughs) (laughs) You mean something stronger than tea. (laughs) But you're on duty. Well, not officially. Not officially, I'm not. Well, scotch? Yeah. um, Uh, Bourbon, then. Rye, actually. Oh, dear, I don't think I... Well, I might. Let me look. Lieutenant, if you're not on duty, officially, why are you here? Oh, that, uh, well, uh, two reasons. One is your friend's mother. Minerva, her mother? Yeah. Is it a fact you've been helping to support Miss Hall's mother in a sanitarium in Cleveland? Oh, yes. Yes. But how did you know? Oh, there's lots of ways. Funny thing about police work. You start digging into one thing and you come up with ten other things. Oh, here you are. Oh, thank you. And uh, if, if you'd like to smoke your pipe. Oh, well, thanks. Hey, tell you the truth, I, uh, yeah, I bought a new one. A new pipe? Well, the old one, uh, yeah, I guess it was getting kind of rank. <laughs> <laughs> Try a new kind of tobacco, too. <laughs> so if you really don't mind... No, it's... no, no, no. Huh? You go right ahead. Oh, uh, about Min's mother. Money has always been tight with Min. And I've just uh, helped out where I could, that's all. Mm-hmm. Mm. Let me see. What, um... What is it you, uh like about Miss Hall so much, hmm? What makes her such a good friend? Well, that's a funny question, Lieutenant. 
I'd do anything for men, and she'd do anything for me. It's as simple as that. Mm -hmm. uh, you said you had another reason for coming to see me. Uh, yes. What is it? <laughs> well. You. Now, uh, wait a minute. Don't, don't get me wrong, Miss James. Uh, Rachel. I, I don't know how to put this exactly, but... Uh, well, it, it, it's like this. I... Oh, hang it all, Rachel. I like you. Well, I, uh... Like you too, Lieutenant. You do? Mm-hmm. Well, uh, women, they, they scare me. Always have. But not you, though. Mm -hmm. You, well, you... You... You know what I mean? Uh, I think I do, yes. Come in. Oh, Minerva. Feeling better? Oh, sure. I just thought I'd lie down for a while. Brought you a cup of broth. Good and hot. Oh, thank you. That's very thoughtful of you. This bedroom of mine always has been chilly, even with the gas heater going. Yeah, so here. This will warm you up. Mm-hmm. So you did the town with Lieutenant Forbes last night, did you? Uh-huh. It was a marvelous time. Just to be taken out again would have been fun, but Mike, he's a wonderful man, Min. <laughs> you better be careful. You know what they say, marry in haste, repent and leave. Oh, Min, who said anything about marriage? In your eyes and that look on your face, that's what says... Oh, nonsense. There's no thought of marriage at all. We hardly know each other. Oh. I sleep here than I thought. I better start waking up. I have an appointment at Metropolitan Realty at 11 this morning. About the house and land? Oh, and drink that broth while it's hot. Yeah. And I've got appointments at a couple of other real estate firms this afternoon, too. It's going to be able to get those bids I mentioned, but... You won't improve on the offer Mr. Gibbons made, Rachel. Well, maybe not. Oh, good heavens. I can't be this sleepy. Yes. Yes, Rachel, you can. Oh, nonsense. <sighs> I didn't get much sleep, that's for sure, but... Oh, what in the world? Well, you dropped your cup and saucer. Oh, I don't understand that. How could I... Your... Your drug, Rachel. Huh? Sleeping pills in your broth. Enough to knock you out fast. Sleeping pills. Min, what is this? I don't want to do this, Rachel, but I, I got no choice. No choice? It's your neck or mine. It was Art's idea. Art given me. We're lovers, Rachel. Well, we were. Oh, and, and Min, he, he, how could you do this? How could... Mm. Rachel. Rachel. Goodbye, Rachel. Coming, coming. Oh, Lieutenant Forbes. Miss Hall. Uh, Miss James in? Oh, yes, but she's lying down. I hear you two uh, painted the town together last night, huh? Oh, I wouldn't say painted exactly. Enjoyed ourselves, though. Oh, Mr. Whitman, isn't it? Yeah, how are you, Lieutenant? Okay. Yeah, it's quite a bundle of laundry you got there. Yeah, always go out and pick it up Saturday morning. My day off. Well, see ya. Um, I, I'll tell Mrs. James you dropped by, Lieutenant. Oh, well, uh, maybe she'll be up before I go. I really dropped by to see you, Miss Hall. Me? About what? Oh, one of two things. Your mother, for one. My mother? Yes. According to my information, Rachel's been supporting her in that Cleveland sanitarium for years. 
giving you a monthly check for just that purpose. Oh, what of it? I checked with the sanitarium. They told me your mother died four years ago. Gas! What? what? I smell gas up here, Lieutenant Miss Hall. Hey, let's get up there. It's coming from Mrs. Jane's room. Mrs. Jane's room right there. Oh, no. It's locked. Rachel? Rachel! Get out of the way. Rachel! Ah. Rachel! Whitman, get that window open. <laughs> yeah, okay. Ooh, Rachel! Rachel! Wait. Window stuck in it. Break it fast. <laughs> is she... Uh, Lieutenant... Is, is no, she... no, no. Thank God, no. We got here in time. Get into the window. Now breathe, Rachel. And you, Miss Hall, Minerva, stay right where you are. Oh, I- I'm just going down. Stay where you are. You're under arrest for murder. Murder? Arrest? What are you talking about? You know damn well what I'm talking about. Oh, you're out of your mind. Here, you're not making any sense. We find Rachel on the floor by the gas eater, the door locked on the inside. Yeah, Lieutenant, the key is in the lock. And you accuse me of murder? Murder one. And I'll make it stick, Miss Hall. Oh, ho, 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 ho. I take my hat off to you, Rachel. You sure know how to broil a stick. (laughs) (laughs) I'm glad you enjoyed it, Mike. I will never understand how Min could have done to me what she did. Well, it's easy enough to understand. For a cop, it is, anyhow. I meet all kinds. Generous, greedy, those you can trust, those you can't. What makes some one way and some another? Well, that I will never understand. People, you can't figure them out. You figured out the mystery of the locked rooms fast enough. Oh, that, well, that didn't take much. If Minerva had been smart, she'd have gotten away with it. I mean, if she'd used sleeping pills on Carson and Mrs. Parker the way she did on you. Then maybe I'd have bought the suicide bit. But Carson and Mrs. Parker were obviously murdered. So the murderer couldn't have gotten out of their rooms, leaving them locked on the inside. It's impossible, of course. So, and. to... Keep looking for the possible. In other words, how did the murderer make it look as if each door had been locked on the inside when actually the murderer had left the room and locked the door from the outside? And the answer when you found it was so simple. Yep. And once you found it, you knew that the murderer had to be Minerva. Had to be. The murderer had to be present when those doors were broken in. You and she broke into Carson's room. And she was there when the three of us, her, you, me, broke into Mrs. Parker's. And all men did was to take advantage of the confusion. Mm -hmm. And slip the key, which of course she kept with her, into the lock on the inside. As simple as that. Well, you may call it simple. But I think it was a marvelous piece of deduction. For which... You deserve more steak and potatoes. Oh, no, 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 I couldn't. I'm full up. I, uh, would like to smoke my pipe, though. That's okay with you? You better know that it is. And it always will be. Mike. As simple as that. The murderer locked the door on the outside and then, breaking in later, simply slipped the key into the lock on the inside. Simple? I think it's ingenious. I would never have thought of it. Would you? I'll be back shortly. be glad to know that Mike and Rachel are married now with two nice kids. And they live in Rachel's brownstone house. Sentimental attachment, I guess. Mike's made captain. And oh yes, he's got a collection of pipes now. Eight beauties. Each bought on the anniversary of the day he saved Rachel's life. Bought by Rachel. 
Our cast included Mercedes McCambridge, Mary Jane Higby, Robert Dryden, and Robert Maxwell. The entire production was under the direction of Hyman Brown. And now, a preview of our next tale. You can't get anything past our border guards. Yes, it was, it was just an idea. Besides, we, we, we have to fly out of here. I'm going to a convention, and you, you're going on a tour. Now, let me apply some scientific thinking to this. How can I get that platinum up? Oh, no. No, I don't believe it. You don't believe what? What just flashed in my brain. It's so simple, so, so, so ridiculously easy. And it's absolutely foolproof. What is? This plan, this idea. Oh, tell me. No, 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 darling. You're, you're too important. Well, if I'm so important, shouldn't I know? No. Because if you knew, you might unconsciously give it away. Its success depends on your not knowing until exactly the right moment. Radio Mystery Theater was sponsored in part by Buick Motor Division. This is E.G. Marshall inviting you to return to our mystery theater for another adventure in the macabre. Until next time, pleasant dreams. October is birthday month for Weird Darkness, and this makes nine years of doing the podcast. But while it's our birthday, we want the gifts to go to those who help people who suffer from depression, anxiety, or thoughts of suicide or self-harm. That's what our annual Overcoming the Darkness campaign is all about. It's the only fundraiser I have all year long, all October long. You can bring hope to those who are lost in the darkness. You can make a donation right now at WeirdDarkness.com slash Overcoming. That's WeirdDarkness.com slash Overcoming. This year, the total raised will be divided equally between four different organizations that help people who struggle with depression. I'll close out the fundraiser at the end of October and announce how much we raised. Our goal is to raise at least $5,000 this month, and you can help us get there. To donate or to get more information about the fundraiser and the four organizations we're supporting, visit WeirdDarkness.com slash Overcoming. Again, I'm only conducting this fundraiser during the month of October, so please, give right now while you're thinking about it. WeirdDarkness.com slash Overcoming. It is not remarkable that so many of the reported ghosts and phantoms and supernatural visions have been observed just as night was falling, for that is a time when the mind is fatigued and is most subject to hallucinations. And yet, there are some, like that which Captain Nolan saw on the plains of Normandy, which cannot be so easily explained away. <laughs> cavalry troops under the command of Captain David Nolan had rendered valuable service in a score of crucial battles. They had been under fire for weeks on end, and now they were retiring behind the lines for a rest, a rest they had fully earned. The long column of horsemen moved slowly, wearily through the twilight. At their head rode Captain Nolan and two other officers. They were discussing how they intended to spend their leave. Uh, you men can celebrate all you like. The only thing I want to do is to sleep. Each man to his own taste, Digby. Mine happened to run toward wine, women, and song. That sounds much more attractive to me. In the state I'm in, I couldn't even think of... Good Lord. Captain Nolan broke off abruptly in the middle of the sentence. For it was just at that moment that he saw the phantom horsemen. They were clad in white, on white steeds. And they rode in a straight, silent column, paralleling the line of the captain's own men, not more than a dozen yards away. 
so swiftly did they move and so soundlessly that their horses' hooves seemed scarcely to be touching the ground. And the column did not end. It went on and on, one ghostly figure following another through the gathering dusk. Captain Nolan's first impulse was to turn to his fellow officers to call their attention to the amazing vision. But then he thought better of it, so he rode on in silence. For some reason, the men beside him had grown silent too. But a few moments later, while the captain's eyes were still fastened on the incredible cavalcade, Lieutenant Digby said suddenly, You may have something there after all, Captain. I could stand a good night's rest myself. Nolan turned sharply and peered into Digby's face, as though he was seeking something there. What made you change your mind? Oh, I don't know. I... I suppose I'm more tired than I thought. It seemed to hit you rather abruptly. Yes. Yes, it did, didn't it, Captain? And that was all the lieutenant would say. And once again, silence fell among the three men. But this time, it was short-lived. For after another moment or so, Lieutenant Wayne blurted out violently, almost hysterically, I can't stand this any longer. You see them? So does Digby. We're not dreaming. And we're not just tired either. That column of carrymen is really there. If it weren't, why should all three of us be watching it? Yes, each of the three officers had seen the column at the same moment. And each had remained silent for fear of making himself look ridiculous. Night descended swiftly now, and the phantom horsemen were blotted from view. But at the next town, Captain Nolan sent back a searching party. They returned with the inevitable answer. No other cavalry troops were in the vicinity. None could have been. And yet, afterward, Captain Nolan and Lieutenants Digby and Duane, all men of unquestionable integrity, were willing to swear that they had seen the same identical vision. A vision incredible but true. Lipton Tea and Lipton Soup present Inner Sanctum Mysteries, starring Lee Bowman. Good evening, friends. This is your host, Raymond. Welcome to the Inner Sanctum. Come in, won't you? Uh, what are you staring at? The walls. Well, you know that old saying about walls having ears. Well, these walls have eyes and a nice assortment of fingers and hands. One of them has a heart, but you can't beat that. <laughs> uh, don't mind me, friends. In my old age, I'm getting to be a bit of a gore. You're getting to be a crotchety old bachelor, that's what. Who said that? Oh, Mary Bennett. Hello. Uh, tell me, Mary, do you think I should get married? You know, I used to have a girlfriend, but she threw me over. She was a vampire. She said I wasn't her blood type. Oh, Mr. Raymond, please, what a silly thing to say. More and more, I'm convinced that what you need is a wife. I'd just love to see the way a wife would handle you. Would you send me a wedding present, Mary? I sure would. I'd send you a big supply of Lipton's noodle soup. You know, I'll bet your wife would appreciate that. My goodness, in the old days, it took a woman all day to make a pot of noodle soup. Whereas nowadays, it only takes a jiffy. That is, when you use Lipton's noodle soup mix. But Lipton's has got the same homemade taste, believe you me. It's got the same chickeny flavor. Yes, sir, a hot plate of Lipton's noodle soup is a grand welcome home for the whole family. One whiff of that savory Lipton's noodle soup, and folks feel relaxed and ready for dinner with a rousing good appetite. Well, now, that's a very pretty picture, Mary. Which reminds me, our story tonight is about one of the fine arts, murder. <laughs> it's called Death is an Artist, an original tale by Frederick Matho. 
And our star is from Hollywood, Lee Bowman, soon to appear with Rita Hayworth in the Columbia Technicolor picture tonight and every night. So, Curdo, close to the fire and turn the lights down real low. Uh, uh, by the way, if you have a little spook or two in your home, uh, looking behind your shower curtains before turning on the water is the courteous thing to do. Otherwise, you might be dampening your spirits. <laughs> now let's get on with our story. I'm Stevie, a reporter. I'm what's called a police reporter because I hang around police stations for my stories. But tonight, I'm the best reporter in the world because I've got that kind of a story that's only given to one writer in a thousand, once in a lifetime. This story begins with the end of a man's life. Yesterday, an old man living alone with his five cats on an abandoned barge under the Brooklyn Bridge cut off the heads of four of his cats then expertly slit his own throat from ear to ear. At six o'clock on the morning we got the flash about this old man, I was playing cribbage with Mike, my police pal, at the station house squad room. Burke, the desk captain, was snoring his head off. Okay, Mike, there it is. Go, 121 points. That last run made it. Uh, you're the luckiest jerk, Stevie. We're both lucky. Not a call the whole night. I uh, sure hate to drive out to anything in this blizzard. We... Uh-oh. Brace, uh, uh, 84th Precinct, Brooklyn. What? Yeah. Uh, wait, say that slower. Uh, you haven't seen him in a week. He's can't see it around. Oh, but lady... Huh? Blood in the snow. Well, that's different, sure, sure. Yeah, okay, thanks. What's up, Captain? Uh, some dame passes an old barge down the foot of the bridge on her way to work every day. It says an old bum lives there with his cats. Uh, don't tell me I got to rescue a cat now. No, this coot talks to her real polite every morning. But she ain't seen him in a week. Today she goes to look close like and finds blood in the snow near the door. So so we go see. We'll probably went south for the winter. Uh, Come along, Stevie. Yeah, but I don't like it. Burke mentioned cats, and I hate cats, and I hate people who keep cats. Well, this is it, I guess. Come on, Stevie. Hey. Hey, look, Mike. There's a snowman. Oh, so what? Haven't you ever seen a snowman? Yeah, but look. That's... that's not an ordinary snowman. It's a beautifully sculptured head of a woman. Made out of snow. Ah, come on, it's cold. Let's get inside this scow here. Hey, open up. Open up there. Open up inside. There is blood out here, Mike. Look. See? Here's where the woman's footprints still. Okay, must... Sherlock. Help me bust this door. Okay. Uh. Uh. What's the matter with you? Look on the floor. Holy mackerel. One, two, three, four cats with their heads cut off. And another one. Alive. Hey, where are you going? I told you I can't stand them dead or alive. One of them clawed me when I was a kid. I... Stevie, get a load of this over here on the bed. He did a good job from ear to ear. He had done a good job. He was naked to the waist, and his hairy torso was bathed in blood. His head lay to one side and was nearly severed at the throat. His mouth, a strangely sensitive mouth, hung foolishly open in the middle of a matted mass of beard. But it was his eyes that, that stirred something inside me. They were coal black agates that smoldered with defiance, even in death. They seemed to carry a message only I was meant to see. I turned away and stumbled over a small wooden box. It contained clay fragments. An impulse seized me, and I, I carried the box outside. What do you want that box of trash for? I, I, I'm not sure. I, I 
I just felt I ought to take it along. Mind? Uh, just junk. These bums collect the screwiest stuff. Uh, come on, I'll drop you off at your paper. You'll get a news beat on this anyhow. Okay, Mike. Thanks. I'll call you later to see if you identify the old bird. All right, Stevie. Hey, uh, here's that box of junk. You, uh, you want it? Oh, oh yeah. Yeah, thanks, Mike. I wrote the item. All we could learn was that he was Ivan. No fingerprints on record, no relatives, just Ivan. So he stayed just Ivan to a quarter of a million readers and to the police. But to, to me... He was a man who had not yet died. I poked through the rubble of clay in the box, and uh, I was about to throw the whole mess out when a, a, a time-blackened metal tag caught my eye. It was the kind of tag used to mark paintings or, or statues. It read, Agatha, January 2nd, 1924. Twenty years ago, today. And below that was a name... Ivan Thorne. The name jangled a bell in my memory. It, it frightened me. It fascinated me. I rummaged in the box some more. A hunch grew to certainty. Ivan Thorne had been a sculptor. Here was a fragment of clay, a nose. Here, part of a chin. Here, an, an ear, a woman's ear. And the snow image of a woman's head came to mind. Why did Ivan Thorne, a sculptor of obvious talent do a head of a woman named Agatha in clay, then on the same date, 20 years later, as a bum, reproduce it in snow and slit his throat. I found the answer in the yellowed clippings of the newsroom morgue. The story of Ivan Thorne was filed under murders unsolved. After I'd read the story, I marched into G.C.'s office. Hey, what's up, Stevie? They say the Brooklyn Bridge again? No. You, uh, you read the item on the old guy I found with his throat cut? Sure, sure. Cut off his cat's heads, then his own. Unidentified. Good item. I... I know who he is. Was. Yeah? Story? Story. You got time to listen? Shoot. Well, this begins in a sculptor's studio off Washington Square on a stormy night long ago. Ivan Thorne and Agatha, his wife, were having the last time, Agatha. Are you really going through with this divorce foolishness? For the last time, yes. I'm tired of living from hand to mouth. I'm tired of your stupid statues. I'm tired of your stupid cats. I'm tired of you. All right. I'll give you the divorce. You can marry Greg Stevens. He'll give you everything you want. But Horace stays with me. I want custody of the boy. The court will decide that. Agatha, I've been working on that head of you for a year. It, it's good. I think the museum... Oh, will... that thing? It doesn't even come close to looking like me. Of course, that head isn't you. It's what I remember you as when I first met you. Ivan, let go of me. You're hurting me. All right. I'll let go of you. But I'm going to finish that head, Agatha. And you're going to help me. I will not. You'll get your divorce. Only if you agree in writing to pose me one day each month for six months. I must finish it. Six months, hmm? And what about Horace? He's away at school all the time. We'll let the court decide a decent arrangement. All right, Ivan, I'll do that. Give me that pen. Here. I, Agatha Thorne... Agree to pose for a sculptured head by Ivan Thorne on the first day of each month for six months. Signed, Agatha Thorne. There you are. Now, get out. Get out before I break your neck. <laughs> She's gone. She's gone. But I'll see her again. 
Six more times. That's all I need. Six more times. <laughs> This Ivan guy is working up a neat little cat astrophe. <laughs> Mr. Raymond. Uh, oh, uh, yes, Mary. I got to thinking about that snowman they found. Did you ever make a snowman? Oh, sure, and I cut off his head for a souvenir. Kept it in the icebox over the summer. You're teasing me, Mr. Raymond. But you know, when I was a child, we used to spend all afternoon making a snowman. And then we'd go in the house for supper with our cheeks red as a frost apple and with a real country appetite. Mm, the house was so warm and cozy. Yes, and, and filled with all the exciting smells of good cooking. <laughs> you know how children are. They play in the snow and then come in ready to eat you out of house and home. And I've got a grand suggestion for these winter night suppers. Lipton's noodle soup mix. It's such a heartening dish. Thrifty, too. Costs a lot less than canned soups. Yes, Lipton's noodle soup just seems to belong to folks young and old who've got a healthy appetite and a yen for homemade chickeny tasting soup. Uh, Mary. Yes, Mr. Raymond? Uh, Mr. Bowman is waiting to resume his part of the young police reporter, Stevie. That's right. Uh, you remember, Stevie told his editor that Ivan was divorced by his wife, Agatha, 20 years ago. And how the events that followed turned the sculptor into the tired old bum he was when he slit his throat under the Brooklyn Bridge. Well, Stevie, did Agatha get her divorce? Yes, and the court gave her custody of their six-year-old kid, Horace. Hmm. She married Greg Stevens, and according to these clippings, she kept her agreement with Thorne. She posed for the head he was doing of her so that he could finish it. The first day of each month for six months, huh? Yeah. How'd he take the divorce and losing his kid and all? Beautifully. So everybody thought. It got to be the talk of the town. The three of them, Agatha, Greg, and Ivan, seemed to get along fine together. The Stevenses were frequent callers at Thorne's studio. Oh, I say, Thorne, why won't you show me the head you're making of Agatha? It isn't fair, you know. Well, not till it's finished, Greg. You wouldn't appreciate it as it is now. It really is good, Ivan. When will you finish it? Yes, Ivan, when? I want to finish it on New Year's Day. That will be the last time you need pose, Agatha. Can you make it that day? Well, I'll just have to, won't I? Yes. At three o'clock? At three o'clock. Come on, Greg, darling. Good night, Ivan. Good night, Ivan. My goodness, six months goes by so fast, doesn't it? Six months. I gave them six months. One day it's over. One day is the last day she poses for me. One day I'll finish that head. I love her. And for six months, six centuries, she belonged to that idiot. He took my son from me. You can't hear me, Agatha. Can you? This is you and Clay. You can't hear me. <laughs> Everybody thinks it's wonderful that I haven't thought of such a good sport about it. I fooled them all. I fooled you. Yes. <laughs> I fooled even you. really was out of his mind, Stevie, this Ivan guy. Sure, but with a madman's cunning, he disguised it well at that point. Only his cats knew it, I guess. Well, what happened then? New Year's Day, 1924, was a howling wintry day. Neighbors later testified to seeing Ivan's massive frame, coat flailing open in the wind, arms loaded with groceries, eyes staring, unblinking, as he turned into his building. It was the last time they saw him. In his studio, Ivan kicked his door shut and began talking to Agatha's statue, as he'd gotten into the habit of doing now for some time. I'll set the table by the fire, Agatha, just as we always did. You like that? 
And I'll set a place for little Horace. Oh, I know you don't want him to come here, but we'll just make believe. Huh? I, I must, must pull myself together. I know you, Ragged. Come in, come in. And the same to you, Ivan. Oh, let me get to that fire quickly. I'm frozen up. Why are you bolting the door? The draft rattles the door. Here, give me a coat. Now, how about a bite? By the fire? Why, Ivan. <laughs> how quaint. Just like old times, hmm? This is the last time you'll come to pose. Have you minded living up to our agreement? No, Ivan. You've been very decent about it. But tell me, why are you so set on finishing the head you're doing of me? Have you ever seen a human skull, Agatha? Ugly thing. Long after that pretty head of yours becomes a skull, the head I'm making of you will live in ageless bronze. That's why I'm so anxious to finish this work. I see. Well, shall we start, Ivan? Ivan, you're not working. You, you're just staring at me. I'm studying the line of your neck, darling. It eludes me. Well, hurry, please. I've sat here for two hours now. I'm tired. I'll be finished soon. Then you can rest. Darling, then you can rest. Ivan, you... You're looking at me as though... You... Ivan! You've moved your head again, darling. Here, let me show you. There. So. Just like this. Don't move, Agatha. My fingers are loose on your throat. In a split second, I can sink them into you tight, like this. I've loved you more in these few months. You've been away from me than I ever did before. I'll always love you. But if I can't have you, no one else can. Ivan, you're mad. You can't. I gave you six months with that fool because I wasn't sure. I thought I could get over losing you and the boy. But I... I can't. We all thought you were... Resigned. <laughs> no. But even now, I don't know if I want to kill you, Agatha. I... I'm not sure. No. No, you don't. You know you don't. Think of Horace. Your son. I am thinking the... of your little fool. Oh, Greg. Greg, help me. Greg. Greg. You've got the nerve to speak his name here. Now. <laughs> You want better. I did it. But you, you made me do it. How beautiful you are. Dead. Look at this clay head. I could have seen. I was wrong. You're much more beautiful. I've changed my mind. I don't want fame. I don't want a statue. I want you. See, Agatha, I've broken it, smashed it. It's Greg Stevens who should die. He did all this to us. Well, yes, I'll go see Greg. That's it. But I must be careful now. I must make Greg suffer. Yes. He must know that he too has lost Agatha. Wow, that's some yarn, Stevie. He actually strangled Agatha, huh? What happened then? He left his studio and called at the Stevens' house a little after six. Greg Stevens and young Horace were the only ones there, except for the butler. He testified that Ivan quietly asked to see Stevens alone. He had a bundle in his arms, covered with a piece of black velvet, when Gregory greeted him. 
Ivan. Well, glad to see you and Happy New Year to you. But where's Agatha? She was supposed to be with you. She'll turn up shortly. Said something about a girlfriend she had to stop by for. Oh, I see. Well, come on in, Ivan. We can have a glass of sherry while we wait. Thanks. Uh, put your package down somewhere on the table here. Thank you. Uh, did you, um, did you get a lot done today on the head, I mean? Hmm? Yes. I've, uh, finished it. Oh, good. Say, that wouldn't be it in that box, would it? Yes, as a matter of fact, it is. Well, good heavens, man, let me see it. I've been kept from all this long enough now that it's finished. Oh, wait. Look... Till Agatha gets here. I'm going away for a while, Stevens. Before I go, I want you to tell me something. Do you love Agatha? A lot, I mean. A lot? I worship her. I adore her. You know what you did to me when you took Agatha and my boy from me? Well, the choice was hers. I'm glad for my sake. I'm sorry for you. But I thought you were resigned by now. Resigned? You poor fool. I've lived a life of raging hate for you. Ivan, sit down. You don't have to be sorry for me anymore, Greg. You can start feeling sorry for yourself. Thorn, what are you driving at? Everything comes out even, Greg. Come over here. What's in that box? Come closer, Greg. Here. I'll take the cloth off. See for yourself. Agatha. You... You fiend. You beast, I'll kill you. <laughs> Hates, doesn't it, Greg? Hates to lose, Agatha. <laughs> doesn't it? I'll kill you, I'll kill you. No, oh, you won't. Get away from me. You won't kill me. I won't kill you. We'll both live to remember. <laughs> Thorne didn't kill Stevens? No, J.C. He knocked him out. They found his footprints in the snow along with the kids. He must have stopped to say goodbye. What a story. He slit his throat this morning as a bum on a barge. Yeah. Took his cats with him. The clay fragments I found in that box on the barge were all that was left of the clay head of Agatha. Nobody even found out how he got away or managed to stay hidden for 20 years? No. That's his secret. Well, write it up, stupid. I can't. I won't, J.C. You can't print that story. The devil, I can't. Where's this Greg Stevens? Where's Horace, the kid? Find him. Greg Stevens died penniless and insane a year later. His kid was raised in an orphan asylum. Well, find the kid. Now, let's see. He'd be about uh, 26 today. Maybe he doesn't know any of these things. What a scoop. Get busy. Look, you can't print this story. Why do you think I didn't write it up and hand it in? I feel sorry for the kid. I was raised in an asylum. A story's a story. What do I have to do? Draw you a diagram, G.C.? Why do you call me Stevie? Well, because your name is Stevens, I guess. Good heavens. You don't mean... Yes, my name is Stevens. I never use my first name. I don't like it. It's Horace. That's right. You're Horace Stevens. Yes. My father was Ivan Thorne. <laughs> Sculptor in your home. Hmm. Better take his modeling away from him. Might grow up to be a bust. <clears throat> That's enough to give anybody the creeps. It certainly is, Mr. Raymond. Uh, oh, <laughs> Mary Bennett. Say, didn't you like our story tonight? Well, it was exciting, all right, but why don't you tell stories about normal, happy people? Of course, folks like that never get murdered or anything, but interesting things happen to them. Nice things, too. Like discovering Lipton's noodle soup, huh, Mary? Well, why not? Lipton's noodle soup is a good way to brighten up a meal, and good meals are a mighty important part of life. So, folks, maybe you've tried other envelope soups, but if you've never tried Lipton's noodle soup, you've got something real nice ahead of you, because Lipton's is the favorite noodle soup of them all. <laughs> Our moral for tonight is don't drive alone. 
If you have a car, lucky you, form a carpool. Then, if you should have a flat tire, you'll be among friends on that cold, cold highway. Fun, huh? <laughs> And uh, Uncle Sam says join a carpool, too. He's not kidding. He says your carpool will help save gas and tires, so look to it, Max. Uh, yes, the, um, this month's Inner Sanctum mystery novel is Net of Cobwebs by Elizabeth Sanksay Holding. Oh, yes, and you won't forget to look for Lee Bowman with Rita Hayworth and the Columbia Technicolor picture tonight and every night. Well, now it's time to uh, say goodnight until next week at this same time when Lipton Tea and Lipton Soup again present another Inner Sanctum Mystery directed by Hyman Brown. Good night. Pleasant dreams. <laughs> Folks, I got to thinking about wintertime, about snowmen and frost pictures on the windows, and about how cozy a house can be when there's a gale blowing outside. And then I got to thinking about Lipton tea, because a cup of Lipton's, the tea with that brisk flavor, really hits the spot. It's so cheerful and, and warming. You know, the word brisk, B-R-I-S-K, means that Lipton tea has a fresh, lively flavor. It's never thin or wishy-washy. That's why Lipton's is America's favorite tea. So don't forget to ask for it when you go to the grocery store. And don't forget to tune in next Tuesday night for another Inner Sanctum Mystery. This is CBS, the Columbia Broadcasting System. October is birthday month for Weird Darkness, and this makes nine years of doing the podcast. But while it's our birthday, we want the gifts to go to those who help people who suffer from depression, anxiety, or thoughts of suicide or self-harm. That's what our annual Overcoming the Darkness campaign is all about. It's the only fundraiser I have all year long, all October long. You can bring hope to those who are lost in the darkness. You can make a donation right now at WeirdDarkness.com slash Overcoming. That's WeirdDarkness.com slash Overcoming. This year, the total raised will be divided equally between four different organizations that help people who struggle with depression. I'll close out the fundraiser at the end of October and announce how much we raised. Our goal is to raise at least $5,000 this month, and you can help us get there. To donate or to get more information about the fundraiser and the four organizations we're supporting, visit WeirdDarkness.com slash Overcoming. Again, I'm only conducting this fundraiser during the month of October, so please, give right now while you're thinking about it. WeirdDarkness.com slash Overcoming. a key. There's a key to every situation. Behind every unopened door, there is a mystery. And the opening of this door introduces us to another in the series, the key. The Valsi's dead. Dead? Who killed him? You. I did. You're crazy, Keeling. You killed him. You did the Paulson job together. Twenty grand. The watchman was killed. You lit out, taking the door with you. You double-crossed Sabalski. Well, maybe I did, but I, I didn't kill him. 
Now Sobalski's dead. And the cops have your gun. With your fingerprints and one shot fired. What are you talking about? I haven't got a gun. I haven't had a gun in months, Keeling. You know that. Cops don't like you. I didn't like Sobalski. But he's been killed and they've got your gun. With your fingerprints and one shot fired. Yeah, but that gun killed the watchman. And Sobalski confessed to the killing. I got news for you. Gideo huh? aims to take over your city territory. To do this, he has to get rid of you, but permanent. He's fixed it to make it obvious you wanted Sobalski dead. You did. Sobalski was the character who could send you up for a lifetime. Now, Sobalski is dead. Well, maybe he is, but I didn't kill him. You've been hiding up here in the mountains, Nordal. Gideo on the city has had time to fix things real pretty. As far as you're concerned, and Gideo, you killed Sobalski. Now, Sabowski being dead, and the evidence being fixed, don't you suppose the cops will take advantage of it? It seems to me you've got a safe deposit key on you. Safe deposit with 20 grand inside. Seems to me that key is the key to the whole situation right now. Hmm. Lock that door, Keeling. We'll talk over the situation. get over that fact, Nordal. Sabalski has been killed, cold-bloodedly and intentionally. There's only one thing to do. Collect your dough from the safe deposit and get out of here. Ah, uh, but I've been safe enough here since the Paulson job. Why should things suddenly change now? Because Sabalski is dead. Edio has fixed it, so... All right, all right. I'll tell you this, though. I'm not giving in that easy. If the cops come after me here, I'll fight. What with? Fists against guns? Your chance is to get the dough and get out and... <coughs> What's that? Hey, lay off the nerves, will you? Nora drops the cup and you start jumping around like a dope. Hey, what's the matter with you, Nora? Let us run, boy. Maybe that car coming up the track. What? Uh, the cops... This you, Keeling? You and the rat again? Lay off. Cops and me are strictly oil and water. Be taken by the cops along with you? No, thanks. They followed you. They followed you here. They tagged your car. But what's the matter with you? You're like a yak and the cops driving up to the front door. Get out of it. Run, Nordy. No, no. I've done my running. Give me a gun, Keeling. Like being naked in Times Square? But you got to let me fight my way out. And be kept down. Oh, that's you crazy. Run for it, Nordy. Listen to me. If you've ratted Keeling, I'm... For Pete's sake, get out of here. You're mine, Nora. You're mine. You've come, too. I've got no reason to hide out. Come on, come on. Is there something between you two? Of course there isn't. Now will you go? All right. You'll be around, though, Keeling. And you, too, Nora. I'm coming back. For a big time, Nora, you're awful slow on the getaway. Give me a gun. No. Give me that gun. Get wise. A gun and Sabowski dead. Cops would cut you down and laugh. Hey. How did you know Sabowski died? I got ears. And flap them, too. All right, all right. But they're not going to take me. That's not the postman. Well, let them come. They ain't going to take me so easy. Hello, Nardo. Gideo. Hello, Nardo. You all alone here? No, not now. The rats are so thick around here, a ship must have sunk. They tell me you got some dough in a safe deposit, Nordo. Maybe I have, maybe I haven't. You aim to take it? No, now, boys. You've not along well enough in the past. Why fall out now? Nordo, grab your ears and put your head over your mouth. Any femme squeaks, it's a slapping for sure. Why'd you come here, Gideon? sabowski has been killed. You hear about it? Uh, maybe I heard so. Like medals, I pin them on. I'm pinning this rap on you. 
Men talk not. Give me the 20 grand from the post and job. Get out of yourself. Or I'll kill you. I'll get you. Get Nora. Get 20 grand. And take over your territory. That safe deposit key is someplace you won't find. All right. All the same. I get you. Get Nora. Get your territory. Yes, I can make do with either 20. One thing, Gideo. Killing. You got a flu, Gideo? You maybe feel you want to scratch? Go for your gun and I'll save you the trouble. I'll shoot the flea. Ah, funny stuff. Been thinking that line up long? Been thinking you're making a fool of yourself. Sadowski's dead and Nordal knows the heat's on him. Why choke up and do the killing to yourself when the cops can do the job for you? Yeah. Makes sense. But since from a dope makes me edgy. What do you want to help Nordal for? I'll tell you honest. Nordal and I, we work together on a few jobs. I don't like the guy over much, but I don't want to see him cut down. If the cops get him, well, that's different. No, you touch me. He hasn't got a chance, Gideo. Sabowski dead and the cards stacked against him. Let him go. Let the cops do the killing. You got the drop on me, Keely. Okay. But I tell you this. The cops had better get him. If they don't, you'll be the one cut down. And it won't be done fast. All right, Nodal. You got 15 minutes to clear out of here. Down on the Highway 7, there's a bunch of cops in a patrol wagon. They're going to be told where you are. Goodbye. Okay, boys, scram. We're leaving the fish to fry it. Uh... Hold it. Let him get away. Okay, we move. Got my car on the back. Okay, Nordal? Nordal? Hey, uh, I don't know as I get this, Keeling. What's what's the game? What, what's the idea? Nordy! I'm for talking Keeling's car. You've got a chance to get away now. You take it. Yeah, but I... I, I don't... Minutes, us, Nordal. That isn't a lot of time. Let's get going. You're on the mic, Keeling. You're up to something. Up to shooting you if you don't move. Oh, Nordy, come on. You don't mind the cops catching you here, but me? Me, I'd like a perm again. Healing, believe it or not, country living is not my style. I believe it. Hey, well, where are we going? I haven't moved out of that cabin inside five weeks. Six, maybe. Maybe maybe two months. Make up your mind. Going? What does it matter so long as we do go? The cops are after me. Why do you bother? Why did I bother coming out to warn you? On account of I don't like video. On account of you're out of the city permanent. And on account of a lot of things. What things? Look, Nordy, we're getting away. The cops are after you because Sabowski's dead, and if they get you, they won't be cooking you with gas. Oh, what more do you want? Healing to be brainwashed, maybe screened? And all because you don't know why a pal helps you out. Get in, Nordy. Uh, better come around the other side, Nora. Easy to get in. All right. Easy. Easy. Hidden. Suspicious? No. Well, here we are. In you get Nora. That's the girl. Well, if it's nothing else, a nice day for a ride. <coughs> Hope we don't meet the cops coming up, going down. As a matter of fact, Noodle, I'm uh, not only going to get you away, but I've got an idea how to get you off that murder rap video fixed so nicely. Oh, yeah? Of course, it's uh, tricky business. I can't throw his brains around for nothing. Well, how far are you throwing your brains, and for how much? Oh, maybe a grand, two... You can never tell how much a guy's life is worth to him. What are you talking about? I haven't got a thousand. All I got right now is thirteen dollars. Thirteen? It's 
unlucky. Yeah. Unlucky for me. I don't get a thousand. Unlucky for Nordle. He doesn't get away from the cops. Of course, uh, Yeah. Of course, there is the 20 grand. The 20 you've got locked away in that safe deposit. Killing. I took risks for that. That I keep forever. past the police car, and they didn't look at us. No doubt about it, we've got to have luck in our business. Like you had an order with a Polson affair. Except for uh, killing the watchman, of course. <laughs> that wasn't luck. No? No. Nah. Gadget. My gadget. <laughs> Fixed it in the watchman's lunch tin. Don't say. Real clever. Yeah. He opened it. Wham, he got ammonia blown on his face. All we had to do was tie him up. Kind of a pity he recovered. Didn't know ammonia worked off. Smart, I'll say. Lord, he's clever, I'm telling you. Hey, uh, what was the idea, Keeling, about uh, getting me off the Sabalski murder rap? Oh, no. I'm not so dumb either. Cash and I talk. Dollars make the world go round. Greasy dollars. Lovely. Yeah, I'd rather go to the chair than hand out that dough. I fought for that dough. I did all the planning. It's my dough. Watchman died. Sabalski's been killed. If you want to make three, that's okay by me. Hey, how was Sabalski killed? Who, who killed him? You'd never guess. Not in a million years you wouldn't. Don't worry about how he was killed. It was fast, if that's what you mean. You never heard? Oh, I never heard. No newspapers. I couldn't have them delivered. Didn't dare go out and get one. No newspapers, no TV, no radio. Too bored of chronic. Uh, maybe we are on the run, but it's good to move. Anyway, forget Sabowski. Forget him. Forget Sabowski on the run for a murder I didn't do, even though it may look I did. If you hadn't double-crossed, then the cops wouldn't have known it was your advantage to have Sabowski out of the way. If you... Hey... What's the matter? Behind us. Well, you better go faster. Oh, cop on a motorbike just means you're going too fast. Speed limit on this highway. Uh Uh-uh. No cop. State trooper. And state troopers around these parts don't waste time with no nickel pinch speed limit. Well, go faster, then. He's coming up fast. I'm driving. I go what speed I like. You slam this old jalopy along as fast as it'll go. You don't, and I'll slam your head to the windshield. Forgetting yourself, Nordo. Sure, I'm driving. And this gun says you're keeping still. But you got me out of the hideout. Why are you stacking up on me now? That's easy, Norton. I want dough on account of beating the murder act. Dough from you. Oh, I get it. A pal only for dough. You get it. Do I get it? Oh, come on, come on, Norty. That cop's getting almighty close. I'll visit you in jug, don't you worry. Or if you want to pay a social call to that death cell... Well, I haven't got the dough on me. I, I, I told you I got $13. I told you before I had only $13. I don't want the dough on you. I'll make do with the dough in the safe deposit box. Better that than what'll happen if you hold out, Norty. Rat. Brother rat. Sure. Hungry rat. Hungry rats don't care. I've never heard of ethics. You gonna give me the key of that safe deposit? Hey, you can't win. Risk everything you went out, then get everything thrown at you. All right, Keeling, here you are. The key to 20 grand. Gee, thanks. Only a little key, but boy, is it full of promise. Well, guess this is where the cop gets a rapid lesson in driving. Funny thing, I thought it would work out this way. All along the line, driving up to see you, I kept saying to myself, you watch, this will be the way it works out. You concentrate on your driving or it won't work out anyway for us. Rat. <laughs> Bad loser, isn't he? Especially for a man who rat at first. I've noticed that. One heel always tries to make out the other heel has spurs on. How's the cop? Uh, holding with us. Not for long. 
Bit along here, there's a turn-off, so hang on to your seat. Know something? Motorbikes on a muddy, dirt road aren't so hot. A bit too hot to handle, though. We beat him up to the top of a hill, then we got a nice little surprise called Cops Downfall. <laughs> you know, I like you so much, Noel, I'm even willing to kill for you. Of course, uh, cops aren't really people, and I don't mind because all the dough you're giving me is dough, real dough. Yeah, you'll be surprised. Yeah, I've noticed that. Surprises around nearly all the corners. Hang on, corner on the handbrake makes things kind of sudden. <laughs> Like the character in the cloak and combinations days. Up, up and away. <laughs> Drive into a back wheel skid out of a front wheel. Remember that and you won't go far wrong. Slippery, isn't she? Don't worry, boy. You've got a master at the wheel. At the top here, I stop and you can get out fast. Don't wait, go. Leave the doors, just get. You watch, I'll do a full turn in the car thing. Back she goes. Powie, one cop left. How far are we ahead? Uh, I don't know. A quarter of a mile. I can't see now. The bend cuts him off. Then this is it. Get, get out. Okay, Keeling. Spin around. Rev and twist. Ain't you lovely little cop killer? Fast, eh? Need a Boy, is that cop gonna get a surprise. He's in the car coming back on him. Watch. Now we... Needs another 200,489 other cops to be rubbed. Shouldn't we go see if we can do something? Find him alive? No, thank you. Sorry we have to walk, but it's a great day. Now, about this idea of mine, Oral. The uh, best way to beat a murderer is to have a cop alibi. What are you talking about, a cop alibi? Less I have to do with them, the better. Just as you like, Bertie. Of course, if you don't do it, I'd say. Uh, I guess you have uh, too much to do with him. Murder's a killing job, and Sabalski's almighty dead. Yeah. What was you talking about? I mean, what do you mean, a, a cop alibi? Well, it's like this. The boys often put it. So happens I know a job was done on the first national over in Birdville. So happens I know it was pulled right at the same time as Sabalski died. Cops know, too. You mean that I ought to... I ought to give myself up for that job? Sure, sure. Why not? Send you up there. Uh, maybe for five years. But what five years when the other job means permanent uh, rehabilitation up where clouds make do as a seller? Five years. It's a long time. Five stinking years in the jug, and when I come out, I ain't got no dough. Why not? Well, you got the key to the strong room. Oh, yeah. Forgot that. Oh, well. Don't give yourself up for that bird to break. You and Sabalski, Watchman, will have a great laugh about it. Great. Look, Nordy. Everybody must have known you'd want Sabalski rubbed. Now he is, and Gideo's fixed it. And that means shock treatment for you. You give yourself up for that birdful job. Honest. I know what I'm talking about, Nordle. Say, look. Here. Hey, you got a newspaper. Hey, what's that, what's that say, the headline? What's that? Uh, Sabalski dead. Uh, well, what was I telling you? Hey, let me read You that. don't want to read that. Here. Uh, huh? Now, look. This is what you want to read. Birdville bank robbery. That's it? Read it good. Get all the details. Then, go give yourself up as doing it. Honest, Nordy, it's the best. The only way. Yeah, well, I'll think about it. One thing for Nordle, he does go to his fate looking just like a film star type. <laughs> I couldn't believe it. You talked real good. Honest, I've never seen a man taken in so easy. Be good to Nora. 
It's uh, not the doing, Nora. You see, it's it's, uh, it's how you do it. Do the bird do great, then get a stooge to confess. Not only to confess, but uh, hand over twenty grand. Got the key? Hmm. You get he all want his share. Sure, but it was my idea. Now Nora will be out of the way for at least five years. He'll be so pleased he'll give me half easy. Maybe kill him. Huh? Could be. Just keeping tags on you, checking up. Coming along to the safe deposit with you. You know you have to sign before you get the duplicate key from the bank guard. Sure. Nora got me a signature. Been practicing. Well? Well, let's go along and see what Sander Nordle has left us in his safe deposit stocking. And allow me to congratulate you on the sweetest double cross yet. Afternoon. Uh, well, now, Nordle, you signed a confession, so I understand. Confession? Yeah, yeah, I can speak open. I mean, there's nobody to hear, nobody to pull a fast one if I tell you something. I mean, nobody like a, a lawyer. Or... If you wish, I'll I'll treat any information in the strictest confidence. Well, listen to me, I got to tell somebody. I've been framed. Uh, of course, of course. Really framed like this, see? A pal of mine talked me into confessing to the Birdville job so I wouldn't be hauled in for a bigger job. Well, you're uh, very frank. What bigger job? Murder. And uh, did you murder somebody? No, no, that's where the frame comes in. I didn't. But a certain party made it look as if I did. And to escape that rap, I said I'd done the Birdville job. I see. Uh, who was it you were supposed to have murdered? A guy called Sabowski. Zabowski? Yeah. You heard of him, huh? Well, he's the guy, the one that was bumped. I, I uh, I don't know how you're going to take this, Nordle, but uh, Zabowski was <laughs> bumped. But, uh, officially bumped. Man? Well, I, uh, he was killed, wasn't he? <laughs> yes, yes, killed. In the electric chair. He was tried, found guilty, and condemned. If anybody could be found guilty for his death... It could only be the government officials concerned in the execution. Oh, come on, come all on. Right, I'll let you up. I don't know why lawyers are all so impatient. <laughs> oh, thank goodness you've come. I'm afraid Nordle has taken leave of his senses. First of all, he started crying when I told him Sabowski had been electrocuted, and then he started laughing. <laughs> what about? Oh, I know, something about a gadget being fixed in a safe deposit. Something about this time when it's opened, it won't be ammonia, but explosives. I really think you better call a doctor. They'll open up and it'll blow their heads off. And I'm going to do five years for somebody executed. Yeah, you're right. We'd better get the doctor. Closing door finishes the story. Next week, another key will open another door to another story. Mystery. Romance. Or adventure. All start when a door is unlocked by... The key. Ladies and gentlemen, we take you now behind the scenes of a police headquarters in a great American city, where under the cold, glaring lights will pass before us the innocent, the vagrant, the thief, the murderer. We take you now to the lineup. <laughs> Good afternoon, 
nurse you through this, will I, Mr. Magnoni? You know what to do, how to behave. Are you kidding, Lieutenant? I bet I'm your most steady customer at these shows. You know, it's getting so as I look forward to them. You enjoy the lineup, eh, Mr. Magnoni? Well, let's put it this way. If something disturbing don't happen in Magnoni's gin mill, I sulk. If someone don't get their teeth pushed in, I feel like I've been passed by by the world. Yeah, they tell me you had a good one last night. Oh, one of the best. This character got loaded in a way I never saw before, and I've seen many ways. He beat the other man up with his fists, he didn't you? Only with him? his fists. Also in a way I've never seen before. You know, it's a wonder the man didn't die right there. They tell me he's dying in the hospital, though. Maybe murder, huh? You think murder? May I have your attention, please? Hey, there's the sergeant. I like him. He grows on you. On the other side of the wire in the audience room, may I have your attention, please? Thank you. My name is Greb, Sergeant Matt Greb. I'll explain the lineup to you. Each of the suspects you will see will be numbered. I'll call off a number, their name and charge. If you have any questions or identifications, please remember the number assigned to the prisoner as I call his name. At the end of each line, when I ask for questions or identifications, call out the number. If you're sure or not too sure of the suspect, have him held. The officers who took your name will assist you. They're seated among you. Please be prompt with your questions or identification. When the prisoners leave here, they're sent the to the prisoners bathroom. When the leave here, they are sent to the bathroom. I know it as good as he does. Better. Clothes. It makes it quite difficult to bring them back after they leave here. The questions I ask these suspects are merely to get a natural tone of voice, so do not pay too much attention to their answers as they often lie. Bring on the line. All right, boys, come on. Move right up to the end of the stage. You keep moving. Get a move on. Come on. Now turn and face the front. Hands to your sides. Look straight ahead. You, the third boy, lift your face so the light hits it. That's it. Number one, Myron Graham, possession. Where do you live, Myron? 1312 Troost Avenue. What's your business, Myron? I'm a salesman. What do you sell, Myron? What the kids ask me for. What do you for. sell? What the kids ask me for, that's all. Shoelaces, potato peelers, things kids need. High school kids? I don't ask them do they got an education. Number two, Harry Weston, assault. How do you make a living, Harry? I'm a musician. I blow a clarinet. Where? At a toy club on 15th. Why did you hit the girl? She wanted to walk me home. That was a reason to hit her? Sure, two of them were walking me home already. Three girls is a crowd. With me, anyway. Number three, Kip Stanley, theft. Where do you live, Kip? Out of town. Where out of town? Lakeshore Village, 1016 Shore Drive. It's expensive out that way. How do you do it, Kip? I keep my nose to the grindstone. My shoes shine, my pants pressed. I am pleasant and courteous. How do you live in such an expensive place, Kip? Friends lend me money. What friends, Kip? Friends I meet on the street, I tip my hat, bow slightly, show them my revolver. They become friendly, lend me money. Number four, George Miller, assault. Where do you live, George? Look, I, I don't feel so good. Where do you live, George? Matson Hotel on Elm, I think. I got that old the feeling. The man you beat up, George, one. did you know him? Let him huh? sweat a little more, the then i The man I'll you say. beat up, George, did you know him? Look, I keep telling you, I'm not feeling good. The hangover will go away, George. Tell me about the man you hit. I don't remember. Look, Magnoni, if that's the man, tell us. Tell us right now. Are there any questions or identifications from the audience? Any questions or identifications, please? Magnoni. Yeah. Yeah, that's him. Number four. Sergeant, I'll take hold. care of it. Sergeant Graham. Yes, Lieutenant. Number four. Hold for interrogation. Sit down, George. Tell me to lie down. That's what you ought to tell me to right do. Right there, that chair. Sit. Yeah. <laughs> Lieutenant, get some for me, huh? I'll tell you about an oversight, George. The department doesn't provide for hangovers. <laughs> Look, listen to me. Something's happening to me. Get me a doc, huh? Uh -huh. Yeah, whatever it is, it doesn't look good on you. Yes, sir? Get Dr. Lynn up here. Yes, sir. Now you're making me happy, Lieutenant. Fine. Now we'll talk. The man said I beat up a man. Happens every day. People beat up people. People get angry. The man you beat up is almost dead. If he dies, your assault charge will read manslaughter, maybe even murder. You know that, don't you? Don't you? You want to see me, Lieutenant? Uh, not me, Doctor. George. He's had a busy night. Doesn't feel good about it. George had a busy night, did he? Uh, let's see now. I'd say George really did. Hangover? I've never heard it called that, Lieutenant. George is dead. Ah, 
I come bearing gifts, Ben. Oh? Uh, the coroner's report, a few sundry and assorted items, very interesting, and this nice cold drink, and a pair of straws. Ah, you owe thanks, me a dime. Man. Mm-hmm. Ah, that's what I said, you owe me a dime. He was poisoned, eh? George Miller was poisoned. <sighs> okay, you'll buy me a cold drink the next time, huh? Yeah, he was poisoned. It could have been suicide. Dr. Lynn doesn't think so, I don't think so, and I know you don't think so, so why tease ourselves? Maybe we're sick, Ben. I never felt better. Why do you say that? A man dies, our minds say he died because he was murdered. Occupational disease. Nine out of ten times we're right. In the case of George Miller, I know we're right. I don't know yet. That's because you don't know things I know. Oh? First of all, Dr. Lynn's autopsy report on George Miller says Miller was loaded with a type of poison no one in his right mind would choose to kill himself with. What time? All I know is on George Miller, it took almost 24 hours. In the home stretch, it hurt him good, real good. Like a hurt few people know, Dr. Lynn says. Mm -hmm. When you said you had something else, what else? There was a bullet wound in Miller's body. Oh? Maybe two months old. Tended to by a professional hand, Dr. Lynn said. Right here. Return the bottle so you can get your deposit back. Thanks. Not at all. Uh, what else? Well, the technical geniuses say Miller's hair, his mustache, and... Remember his hair and mustache? I remember. A dye job. The color of Miller's hair is brown. It was peroxide that made it what, what it was today. That's all, eh? No. No, that's not all, Ben. I had a photographer fix me up a picture of Miller. How he would look with his natural hair and without a mustache. Mm. Now, here, take a look. Mm. There, that reminds you of somebody? Yeah. But maybe i better check it on the wanted born. Yeah, go ahead and do that, Ben. I already did, but you go ahead and do that. Uh-huh. George Bailey, wanted for bank robbery. Says here under a picture. Mm-hmm. George Bailey, George Miller. Same man. Robbed Springfield Bank, June 1950, with accomplice Joe Raddick. Both at large, dangerous. <laughs> well, let's get Miller's picture in all the papers. The old dope about the robbery. I don't know, maybe the publicity will give us a murderer. Maybe Raddick. Maybe somebody else. You'll know what else to do without my telling you, huh? Sure. I'll get the deposit back on my bottle. <laughs> Here. Hmm? Don't forget your dime. Yes? A man outside to see you, Lieutenant. Who? He just said he's a representative of the Bluebell Cab Company. Well, what does he want? He just said it's a matter of urgency. Well, send him he in. I'm a representative of the Bluebell Cab Company. Now, what do you want? This whole thing is mysterious to me. Yesterday in the rain, I let a fare off in front of the Exeter Hotel. Ed, this fare gets out of the door. Two new fares get in. A man and a woman. Uh, yesterday about... 2 p.m. in the afternoon. What do you want to see me about? Well, after I let the fare off, the man that is, uh, the woman I dumped earlier. Well, anyhow, I get back to the garage, and I see this poster of a man that you police hang up in a garage, be on the lookout for this man, it said. So I said to myself, funny. Not knowing why at the time. Now I know. Look, I'm a busy yeah, yeah, man. you're not too busy for this. Fifteen minutes ago, I opened a newspaper, and I see the picture again. A man who dropped dead from poison in your office. The same as the fare I had yesterday. Only in blonde hair and a mustache to match. Where'd you leave him off? In the middle of downtown, a busy corner. And in anticipation of your question, I left the woman off at another place. You want to know where? Yes, yes, I do. Ruxton Avenue, 1647. Uh, did I interrupt you, Lieutenant? <laughs> The doctor's office hours are from four to six. I'm sorry. Uh, my name's Guthrie, police officer. Oh, I see. Please come in. Did you want to talk with Dr. Crossan? Well, I'm not sure. Uh, who are you? Mrs. Crossan, what is it you want? Do you know a man named George Bailey, Mrs. Crossan? Is he one of my husband's patients? Maybe you'd better talk George to him. George Miller. Well, I'm afraid I don't know what you're talking about. They're the same man. Mr. Guthrie, you might as well know I'm frightened. I'm not used to policemen coming in here and asking about men who have two names about do I know him. Jean? Jean? You'd uh, better talk to my husband, Mr. Guthrie. I'm trying to find out about a woman who took a cab ride yesterday about two. You call me, Craig? Uh, oh. Yes, what is it? Dr. Crossan? Yes, what is it? I'm a police officer, Doctor. Ben Guthrie. I have my regular office hours, Mr. Guthrie, but... Uh... 
An officer? I was asking your wife whether she used a cab yesterday about 2 o'clock. Jean, I don't know why this man is it's here. It's just routine, Mrs. Cross, and don't get upset. My wife is upset. What do you want? About the cab. All I'm trying to do is find out if your wife used a cab yesterday. I don't see how it's It's not possibly... your business to see, Doctor. I'm asking your wife a question, a simple question. There's no reason to get panicky. I'm not panicky. I told you I'm just not used to anything like this. Peg came home in a cab yesterday about 2 o'clock. It was raining, so I took a cab. Of course. Was there a man in the cab with you? Yes. I don't know who he was. Well, what happened, Peg? Well, it was raining. We were both waiting for a cab in front of the Exeter Hotel. I had lunch there, and one stopped. The man said it was his cab. I said it was mine. It was raining. So we both took it. And he dropped you off here. Well, I didn't tell you, Jean, because I didn't think it was important. But I didn't know who he was. I don't have any idea who he was, Mr. Guthrie. Oh, Ben. Uh, come in, ma'am. Any word? Yeah, I got a little news on that man in the hospital, the one Bailey beat up. Oh? The man will be all right, contusions. You know what I can't figure, Matt? Hmm? Bailey's wanted by the police, and he calls attention to himself in a barroom brawl. Well, Dr. Lynn had an answer for that. Bailey was so saturated with that poison, he didn't know what he was doing. Mm Mm-hmm. Anything on Joe Raddick? No, nothing. You? Uh, I made a little call a while ago. Dr. and Mrs. Crossan. Woman looked a little worried. Oh? What about? Mm, I'd say about nothing. The fact that she's a woman, the fact that I'm a police. Uh Uh-huh. She took a ride with George Miller, though, in a cab. Didn't know who he was. Just shared his cab in the rain. So, you figure what? Well, let's not make a big thing out of this, Matt. What I figure is what's obvious. You think his buddy Joe Raddick poisoned him? Don't you? <clears throat> Wait a minute. Van Guthrie speaking. What? Uh, talk a little louder, will you? Oh? Uh-huh, I see. Well, thanks. Well, Matt... Well, what? You think Joe Raddick poisoned Miller? Sure I do. For what's left of the bank hall. Like I say, it's obvious. Find Raddick, we've got Miller's poisoner. We found Raddick. That phone call? Uh Uh-huh. Great. So it's over. Right. It's over, Matt. For Raddick. He was just shot to death. happy to see what splendid names you have made for yourselves among the civilian population. Woodrow Wilson, at that time President of the United States, said this on December 25th, 1918, while addressing servicemen in France. Members of the armed forces have the same duty to represent the United States today, wherever they may be, as did those soldiers during World War I. As U.S. citizens in uniform, our military personnel have definite responsibilities to their God, to their country, and to themselves. All right, Nori, in here. I ain't no criminal. Bring him, Matt. Yeah. Come on, let's go, Nori. But I ain't no criminal. You guys know that, don't you? Sure, sure, sure. Just because there's a dead man here in my beat-up little room and house, you guys let your imagination run hot and cold. Just like I was a lawbreaker, or golly knows what. We just want to get you away from that room, Nori. We want to talk to you before those reporters do. Like I was a golly knows what. How long you been out of jail, Nori? So long ago, I can't remember which way the bars go, up and down or across and across. About six months? Seven. You hear me? I said seven. And since then, you've been running this rooming house? Sure. I studied room and house methods while I was in stir, observed keenly. Golly, What fellas. happened here? Who found Joe Raddick dead? The way you fellas talk to Nori's me. nervous, Ben. Oh? Uh-huh. Yeah, shaking like a leaf. Look at my hands. Gee, look at his hands, Ben. They're really shaking, ain't they, Lieutenant? Gosh. You see, you see? Book him, Matt. Suspicion of murder. Fellas. Who phoned, who found Joe Raddick dead? 
I did. Who called the police? I did. Who killed him? Now, who there, fellas? Who now? Not me, not Moy, not old Noy. Uh-uh, fellas. No, no, But no, you knew no. he was Joe Raddick? Everybody knows Joe. You know he was wanted? You knew he was hiding out here in your hotel? Why didn't you call us then? Oh, that's a question. Did George Miller live here with him? Who? George Miller, George Bailey, you know who I mean. Same room with Joe. Used the room more than Joe. Joe didn't stay around Didn't much. Joe come here every night? Him, Joe? No, 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 not Joe. You know why? The dame used to call for him. They'd go out. That's why, fellas. What dame? Works the Diamond Dance Palace of Angels on Baker Street. Name of Stella Regan. I know. Well, Stella and me, we've danced. Question him and take him downtown, Matt. I'll call you later. Hey, Mac. The way I tower over you so close says you can't go in without you buy rolls of tickets. Rolls. Without rolls, nobody gets in. Oh, why don't you say so right off, Mac? For a policeman, it's free. I will even hold open the door and escort you in. There you are. Pick a flower, policeman. Stella Regan. Wow, Rudy. That's nice picking. A little faded, maybe. A little wilted. But Stella makes the night smell good. She's that one. We sell refreshments, well, too. Rudy, you don't know what it means to me to have you call Stella, on me like this. Miss Regan. I'm very sorry, Peter Pan, but you just lost your chance to Rudy Wetstein here. Uh, however, you may try again tomorrow. No, Stella. I'm from the police. Uh, feed it, Rudy. This gentleman has a priority. Feed it, Rudy, please. Now, come on, dance with me, Peter Pan. I'll arrange about the tickets later. Come on, 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 on. Arrange a place where we can talk, Stella. Quietly. You work fast, Peter Pan. Dance first, then talk. That's what I said. We'll talk first, then dance. Come on. In here. It's good to talk. We girls rest here when we can't bear it no more. So far, it's not unbearable for any girl but me. You, uh, you caught Joe? No, we didn't catch him. That's good, that's good. You're gonna twist my arm to tell you where he is? It's been tried, never worked. We know where he is. He's dead. Shot to death. I got time to cry? Cry if you want, Stella. I cried. You brought me the death notice. You're happy. Goodbye, Peter Pan. He meant that much to you, Stella? You're quick. Yeah, yeah, Joe was that much to me. When did he hook on to George Bailey? Five, six years ago. Joe and me were at a place together, foul as rest. Bailey came to the same place. Joe and George got on great. They knew each other's work, admired each other. That's when they decided to go to work together. Now, this place where you and Joe and George, where you all met, where was it? Foul as rest? On the south side of the lake. <laughs> Joe and me had it good up there. Joe rested there. Try it. I recommend it. You, uh, run out of questions? Goodbye, Peter Pan. Your name, Fowler? The man in the boathouse said your name was Fowler. I'm from the police. Here's the badge. My name's Fowler. Mine's Guthrie. Fowler. I'm trying to get some information about a man, about a couple of men. Who? A man named Joe Raddick. He fished here. And George Bailey. Friend of Raddick's. What can you tell me about them? I told you. They used to come here often. Oh, now and then. Have you got anything against the police, Mr. Fowler? Both of my sons are police. I'm friendly to the police. Then what about Bailey and Raddick? Mm, nothing. They fished. Once they had a big time, a party. Yeah, what was the occasion? Bailey got married. Oh? Crossed the lake in Vineville about six years ago. Come back and had a party. Big party. Very big. I'm friendly to the police, Mr. Guthrie. <laughs> Here we are, Miss Stella. 
Yes, Mr. Guthrie. The vital statistics you asked for be right here in this volume, 1934A to C. You're on the police line, huh? Yes, uh, look Just now... call me Mr. Joyce, Fred Joyce. We'll get on better that way. Fell across the lake has two boys in the police line. Know them well. Mr. Joyce, all yeah, right. I know, I know. Vital statistics. A to C, 1934. Uh, who is it you care about? They're getting married between A and C in 1934. Uh, you want to know who somebody married, don't you? Who? I told you, George Bailey. Uh, yes, yeah, so you did. George Bailey, 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 Bailey. Mm. Fell in here yesterday asking for the same thing. There was? Uh-huh. Yeah. Well, what do you know? What's the matter? That fellow that was here yesterday, the one I told you about. Well, yeah, what about him? Well, the son of a gun tore the whole page out. Must have taken it with him, because it's tore out here, you see? Gee, I'm sorry, Mr. Guthrie. The Vineville Hall of Records just can't help you about who married George Bailey. Yeah, this man who was here yesterday, the man who tore out the page, who was he? Now, don't get riled, Mr. Guthrie, because it won't help, because I don't know. <laughs> uh, wait a minute. I just thought of something. Yes? Little girl next door in the grocery. She was riding her trike on the sidewalk and fell, and this fella helped her, the fellow who was here. I watched him help her. Maybe he and the little girl got acquainted. Some nice vegetables just came in. Uh, you have a little girl, a little girl who fell off her bike yesterday? I have. Why? Someone helped her when she fell. Do you know who he was? No. But my little girl might. We could ask her. But why should we ask her? Because I want to know. Because I'm a detective. Uh, sure you want to know. Carolyn! Come here. Hey, Carolyn! This man's a policeman. He wants to know who helped you when you fell off your bike yesterday. You don't know? <laughs> when she shakes her head like that, it means she don't know. Uh, she's shy with policemen. Uh, now look, uh, Carolyn, uh, that bandage on your leg, who put it there, honey? It's a very good bandage. The kind of doctor would use. Did the nice man who helped you yesterday put it there? And when she shakes her head like that, that means yes. Uh, she's awful shy with cops. <laughs> waiting long? No, just got here. Well, from what you told me over the phone, I'd say you were playing a long shot. Unless you got something else to tell me. No, just what I told you. A bullet wound on George Bailey's body. A little girl with a bandaged leg. Well, the same doctor didn't have to do both of them. Look at it this way, Matt. Assume it was a doctor who bandaged that girl's leg. It could have been somebody else, but... All right. Well, assume it. Why should this doctor be interested in who married George Bailey? Interested enough to tear the page out of a record book. Well, maybe he's the kind of man who likes to tear pages out of books. Come on. Where are we going? That house where that new Nash is parked. The one with the doctor's emblem on it. Dr. Crossan's house. Did you check the bank? Uh-huh. Good. Hello, Dr. Crossan. Mr. Guthrie. Yeah, this is Sergeant Greb, Doctor. May we come in? Please do. Now what, Mr. Guthrie? Is your wife here? Yes. Uh, please get her, Doctor. You want to annoy her again? Get her, Doctor. The lieutenant and I want to talk to her. To you, too. All right. Peg. Peg, come in here. The police are here again, Peg. Oh. Yes, Mr. Guthrie, what is it this time? This time it's a little more serious, Mrs. Crossan. Jean, have they told you what they want? No, they haven't. You've uh, got a pretty good practice here, haven't you, Doctor? I get along. Nice waiting rooms here, nice furnishings. You must get along pretty good. Wouldn't you say so, ma'am? Yeah, I'd say so. You a gambling man, Doctor? No. What right do you have to ask a question like that? That's right, Matt. Why do you ask a question like that? Well, the doctor's been making some pretty heavy withdrawals the last couple of months. I checked his bank. That's the only reason I asked. Oh. 
You a gambling man, Doctor? I have expenses. That's why I make withdrawals. Cut it out, Doctor. You've been paying blackmail. Gene paying blackmail? Haven't you, Doctor? Haven't you, Doctor? Hmm? Or, do you, or are you going to accuse us of surmising? Hmm? What do you say, Doctor? Just because I got in the cab of the man, you hound us. Blackmail to George Bailey and George Raddick, huh? There's Mrs. No Crossan. That. What? You were married to George Bailey once, weren't you? You can't prove that. Gene. You've no proof of it. Because you tore it out of the Vineville records. Well, it doesn't matter. You can't prove it. If we took you back to Vineville and let a little girl look at you, I think we can. A doctor tore the page out of the Vineville records. You. Because your wife's name was on that page married to George Bailey. All right. Are you arresting me for tearing a page out of the book? Oh, for more than that, doctor. You're going to lose your license. We're arresting you for malpractice. Oh, please. Please, it wasn't his fault. Not Gene. You brought Bailey here, didn't you, Mrs. Cross? He forced me to bring him to Gene when he was wounded in that bank robbery. Forced you? How? I was still married to Bailey. Don't you see? I hadn't heard from him for four years. I thought he was dead. I thought he was dead. Go on, Mrs. Crossan. <laughs> then he came to me wounded, and he said if I didn't get Gene to help him, he'd expose me. He'd ruin my husband. You really lost it for me, didn't you, Peg? What? What did you say? You bring him to me, I help him, then they both blackmail me, bleed me. You were a hoodlum's wife, Peg. If you'd told me, I wouldn't have married you, and this wouldn't have happened. After what I did for you. Poison Bailey. When you had lunch with him at the Exeter Hotel. I did it for you. And shot Raddick. Gene, it was for you to rid of those two. For Gene, I did Murderous. I killed for you, Gene. I killed him for you. For malpractice, gentlemen, you'll arrest me for that. You'll note I had no part of the murders. Gene. All right, Doctor. Uh, Mr. Cross. <laughs> Matt. Hmm? <laughs> Don't bother with the cuffs. Lineup has come to you through the worldwide facilities of the United States Armed Forces Radio and Television Service. someone who struggles with depression, whether we realize it or not. It's something that those who suffer tend to deal with in silence, in the shadows. But the organizations we're supporting with our annual Overcoming the Darkness fundraiser this month are working to make it easier for those in the darkness to come into the light, to find help, and to learn that they're not alone, that there are ways to overcome the darkness and live normal lives. I'm evidence of that myself. I, too, suffer from depression. I do this fundraiser only one month out of the year, because October is the anniversary month for Weird Darkness, beginning October 1st, 2015. It's also National Depression Awareness Month, and it's already spooky and dark. Our goal is to raise at least $5,000 this month to help people climb out of their personal darkness. 
If you'd like to make a donation, learn more about the fundraiser, or watch a video about it that I made, visit WeirdDarkness.com slash Overcoming. The fundraiser ends on Halloween night at midnight. Please give what you can. WeirdDarkness.com slash Overcoming. Short stories from the worlds of speculative fiction. Michael Hansen speaking, and on Mindwebs this evening, I do a story from The Eye of the Lens, a book by Langdon Jones. It's called The Hall of Machines. Many great thinkers have attempted to analyze the nature of the hall. However, all their different approaches have been characterized by a lack of agreement and often blatant contradiction of fact. The appearance of the hall is generally well known, but as soon as we try to unearth specific detail, we realize that all is conjecture. The hall is vast. We would expect the descriptions of its contents to vary. One person could not be expected to cover the whole area of its interior. However, there has been a great deal of superstitious rumor concerning its contents, and it's often difficult to separate the true from the wholly fallacious. There's been much conjecture concerning the size of the hall, but no results have actually been confirmed by any kind of measurement. It's been postulated by at least one writer that the hall is in fact infinite in extent. Others, no doubt influenced by exaggerated reports, have maintained that the hall covers a variable area, its size altering by a factor of at least 50. Other evidence, however, suggests that both of these ideas bear, in all probability, little relationship to the facts. During the last few years, I have found it a rewarding task to research all the material I could find that related in any way to the hall. The task has been difficult, but illuminating. I have now in my files a vast amount of information in the form of books, articles, newspaper cuttings, recorded tapes, and movie film, as well as a large number of transcribed interviews on a subject which I have found to become daily more, more fascinating. My research has become to a degree obsessional. I now find that my normal routine has been disturbed to quite a large extent over the last three years. I have devoted a complete room to this work, my ultimate intention being to shape the material into a comprehensive book. All over the wall are pinned the relevant newspaper cuttings, their arrangement depending on whichever aspect of the hall I'm currently researching. Set in the middle of the room is my movie projector. Frequently, I watch five hours of film that I've accumulated at one sitting. And beside it is the tape recorder. On tape, I have, apart from interviews and the commentaries, at least an hour of the recorded sounds of some of the machines actually in operation. I've taken these sounds down as accurately as possible into musical notation. I've permutated the resultant patterns of notes and have found interesting relationships between the basic shapes but as yet nothing more concrete. I now spend a large proportion of my day in carrying out this research. I sit for hours cutting out newspaper articles or developing film in the darkroom I've constructed. 
And so, with scissors, photographic chemicals, music paper, paste, tape recorder, and projector, I've built up a picture that is, it's far from complete, but is remarkable in its specific detail. I would now like to present some of the more striking of the descriptions I've unearthed. They're not delivered in a planned order, but have been assembled to give, rather than a dry academic account, a series of interesting impressions. I believe that one of the most fascinating aspects of the hall is in the diverse impressions it creates within the minds of the observers. When my book is complete, which will not be for some years, it'll run to at least five large volumes. I shall have sufficient confidence in the correctness of my results and also the scope to present them in detail. Until then, these extracts are intended only to communicate the atmosphere of the hall as it appeared to some people. The Water Machine the troughs and gullies of the water machine extend over a large area of this section of the hall. Although it's enclosed by false walls of board, it still gives a sprawling impression. All about our convex metal surfaces. The floor is intersected by runnels and gullies. The water machine is constructed primarily of cast iron, but certain of its parts are made of a lighter metal, probably an alloy such as aluminum. The machine consists of a complexity of large components which stretch probably 20 feet in height. And the whole mass is supported by a surprisingly small number of slim metal struts. Water is being pumped in from a large pipe at the very top of the machine. It is conducted by a series of ingenious mechanical movements through a series of gullies and out of this part of the hall. I thought it likely that the water was moving in a large enclosed cycle and dropped into a nearby channel a small piece of white paper. As I suspected, within about three minutes, the paper came floating past my feet again. The noise of the water is almost deafening at times. Constantly, there's the hissing of the jet at the top of the machine and a rushing of the liquid as it bubbles its way through its course. Also, there's the loud creaking of the metal parts as they operate. Every few seconds, there is an enormous crash as a metal part is activated and the water momentarily redoubles its volume. Water drips constantly from the supporting members, gathers on the floor, and runs down the slope toward the many drains. Concrete channels sweep in graceful lines about my feet. Cast iron conduits curve in black roundness, globules of condensation running along their undersides. Situated at the top of the machine is the vast silver belly of the top water container, spatulate and curved like a vast silver spoon. The lead-in pipe, about six inches in diameter, is pointing into this tank, and a great jet of water like a column of glass is sluicing into its interior. After a while, the container begins to groan loudly. Suddenly, the critical balance is attained. The groaning reaches a climax under the enormous weight of water, and the tank begins to shudder under a volume of liquid that it is incapable of supporting. Overspill slops to the floor and runs down to the square drains. Slowly, Inch by inch, the tank begins to tip its vast bulk. Water spills over its thick pouring lip and falls in a glistening ribbon into a reservoir a couple of yards below. The tank begins to accelerate its rate of movement, and more water gushes down. Faster moves the container, and then with a crash, it inverts itself. A solid mass of water falls into the reservoir, and the ground shudders with the impact. The container, meanwhile, is pulled back to a creaking vertical by a counterweight. Water leaks from the reservoir, 
jetting out with great force from a circle of six holes at its convex base. These six separate streams are all conducted by diverse methods to the ground. One of the streams gushes into a smaller version of the water barrel. Another enters one of the hinged containers set between the double rim of a large wheel, its weight causing the wheel to rotate slowly. After a quarter revolution, the container will snag on a projection and tip up, letting the water escape into one of the channels. Another stream strikes a sprung flange which bounces constantly in and out of the flow, the other end of the flange operating a mechanism like the escapement of a clock. All the streams eventually reach the dark channels or well-set concrete set in the floor and are then conducted away from sight through holes set in the surrounding walls. Behind the wall can be heard the sound of great pumps. Up above, I know, a fountain is playing. Machines of Movement I was passing through a rather enclosed part of the hall now. Its spaciousness not apparent owing to the large bulk of the partitions enclosing various machines when I passed a small wooden doorway set into one of the partitions. On the door was a plaque printed black on white. It said, Interlocking Machine Room. On entering the room, I found it to be full of giant metal crabs. Great struts of thin metal rod crisscrosses from ceiling to floor, making it impossible to see very far into this room. The very air shudders with the vibration of these machines. Although the constructions vary considerably one from the other, a large number of them have the same basic shape. Their nucleus is a mass of rods and other interlocking members, and they stand about ten feet high. The arrangement of these rods is infinitely complex. At their apex, they are thickly composed and are surrounded by other parts that join them and permit their motion. They branch out, and at floor level, each machine covers a considerable area. All of the legs of these machines are connected by free-moving joints to the legs of the other units. And a movement of one causes an adjustment to the position of the other. The whole room is in motion, and the machines twitch each other with an action that appears almost lascivious in nature. A rod near me is moved by the action of a neighbor's leg. This movement is communicated at the top of the unit to another of the legs and it, in turn, imparts motion to a machine still further away. As these machines work, a constant metallic clattering fills the air as if the room is filled with typewriters. The machines are slick and oiled. Their movement is smooth, but gives an impression of great nervousness. All over this chamber are various other parts, all of which seem affected in some way by the movement of the rods. On the wall near me is fixed a plaque with a jointed arm extending from it. Taut wires radiate from either extremity into the skeletal gray. One end is angled up, the other down. As the wire of the higher end is pulled by some motion in the mass of interlocking parts, the arm reverses its position jerkily. Perhaps a million years ago, these machines were constructed in a delicate static balance of frozen wave. And with the locking of the final link in the circuit, the fixing of the last jointed leg against leg, the balance was tripped. A motion would have run its path, twisting and turning about the machine, splitting itself, dividing again until, until today, this movement still ran about the constructions, diffused and unpredictable. A million strands of current still splitting. And perhaps the machines had been so carefully designed that in another million years, all the currents would begin to amalgamate, becoming less and less complex until they finally became two, meeting in opposition and deadlock, all movement ceasing. 
The mind drowns among the interlocking machines. Perhaps the reason is in the similarity of this abstract maze to that pattern formed by the neural current. Perhaps these patterns of motion parallel too closely the patterns of electricity that we call personality, and the one is disturbed by the other. Conversely, perhaps the very existence of a human mind in the room causes little eddies and whirls in the motion of the machines. I was unable to stay in the interlocking machine room for more than a minute or two before the psychological effects became more than I could bear. The clock. A large number of the machines in the hall are partitioned off by boards, so that one often feels that one is walking in a constricted space and loses completely the feeling of immensity that one often experiences in the hall. It was in such a place that I found, set against one wall, the mechanism of an enormous clock. It was all of shining brass, and it stood no less than ten feet high. It was facing the wall, the dials and hands, if in fact any such existed, being completely invisible. The clock was triangular in shape, and supported by a framework of sturdy brass front and back, brass that curved down to provide four feet. There was no plate at the back of the clock, its arbors being seated in strips of brass that curved in beautiful shapes from the main framework. Despite the largeness of the clock, it was built to delicate proportions. The wheels were all narrow-rimmed, and the pallets that engaged the escape wheel were long and curved, like the fingernails of a woman. It was as if the mechanism of an ordinary domestic clock had been magnified to a great degree. There was none of the solidity and cumbersomeness of the turret clock here. I discovered to my surprise that this clock was powered, as most domestic clocks, by a spring. However, this spring was immense and must have exerted a tremendous pressure to operate the mechanism. Although the whole movement was surmounted by the escape wheel and anchor which perched on the apex of the triangle, the pendulum was disproportionately short, stretching down a little more than six feet. The slow tick of this enormous clock was lacking in the lower partials and as a consequence was not disturbing. As the clock was so large, motion could be seen among the wheels which moved each to a varying degree with each tick of the clock. This was a fascinating sight and I stayed watching the clock for a considerable period of time. I wish that I could have seen the clock illuminated by a strong morning sunlight from a window. A machine of death. There is darkness in this part of the hall. Stray light illuminates black, pitted metal. I can see little of the machine of death. It is to my right and is a bleak, high wall of metal. The end of a thick chain extrudes here, turns and plunges back into the metal wall. The chain is a foot wide and four inches thick. The only other feature of this machine is a waste pipe, which is sticking out from the wall. Underneath this pipe is a channel set in the floor, which conducts the waste to a nearby drain. The all-pervasive stink of this drain makes breathing difficult. The pipe is pouring blood into the channel. The next machine is the mother. This machine is standing in isolation, surrounded by space on all sides. It is extremely large, standing almost a hundred feet high. It is shaped like an elongated onion tapering at the top to a high spire. From one side of the machine, from about ten feet up, a flaxed rubbery tube hangs down and outward to a ground level. The onion belly of the mother is completely featureless, and light catches its curves. The tube is of a dull red shade. There are sounds coming from inside the metal body, 
soft but constant. But then, abruptly, they stop, and all is silent. At the top of the tube, a bulge becomes apparent, swelling outward all the time. Slowly, this bulge begins to travel inside the tube, away from the machine and down to the ground. While all of this is going on, one obtains an impression of supreme effort and, strangely, pain. Perhaps it is because the whole process is so slow. The object creeping down the tube will eventually reach the end and emerge into the light. One realizes this and feels an almost claustrophobic impatience with the slowness of the event. There is a feeling also of compression and relaxation. And one finds one's own muscles clenching in time to the imagined contractions. Eventually, the bulge reaches the end of the tube at ground level. This is where the real struggle begins. One becomes aware that the end of the tube is beginning to dilate slowly and rhythmically. The belly of the machine is as smooth and unevocative of any emotion as ever. But it is impossible for the observer not to feel that agonies are now being endured. One realizes that the process is completely irreversible, that there is no way of forcing the bulge back up the tube and inside the metal shell again. Wider and wider grows the aperture at the end of the tube, affording one an occasional glimpse of shiny moisture within. A glint of metal is now and then apparent. The tube dilates to its fullest extent, and a metal form is suddenly revealed, covered in dripping brown fluid. The rubber slides over its surface, releasing it more and more by the second. Abruptly, it bursts free in a wash of amniotic oil. All is still. The oil begins to drain away, and the new machine stands there motionlessly as the liquid drains from its surfaces. It is a small mechanism on caterpillar tracks, with various appendages at its front end that seem to be designed for working metal or stone. With a whir, it jerks into action and moves softly away from the great mother. There's a click from the parent machine and the noises inside begin again. I have watched this mechanism for long periods and, and it appears to create only two kinds of machine. They are both on the same basic design, but one appears to be made for erection, the other for demolition. The mother has probably been working thus for hundreds of years. Now, electric machines stare at me with warm, green eyes. I see nothing but bright plastic surfaces inset with pieces of glass. These are still machines, active but unmoving, and in my ears is the faint hum of their life. The only movement here which indicates that the machines are in operation is the kicking of meters and the occasional jog of an empty tape spool. Their function is not apparent. They work here at nameless tasks, performing them all with electronic precision and smoothness. There are wires all over this room, and their bright primary colors contrast strikingly with the overall pastel tones of the plastic bodies. In a small chamber to the rear of the room of electric machines, there are some more of a different kind. The door to this small room is of wood, with a square glass set into it. The room appears to have remained undisturbed for many years. They line three walls of the chamber and are covered with switches and meters. They hum in strange configurations of sound and appear to be making electric music together. death of machines one. In this part of the hall, all is still. Spiked mounds of time rise around me, their hulks encrusted with brown decay. 
The floor is totally covered by a soft carpet of rust. Its acrid odor stings the nostrils. A piece detaches itself from one of the tall machines and drifts to the floor, a flake of time. Many such flakes have fallen here, in this part of the hall. Time burns fire in my eyes, and I turn my head looking for escape. But everywhere I see seconds and hours frozen into these red shapes. Here is a wheel, its rim completely eaten through. There a piston, its movable parts now fixed in a mechanical rigor mortis. A reel of wire has been thrown into a corner ages in the past, and all that remain are its circular traces in the dust. My feet have left prints in the rust carpet. Death of Machines 2 I had come into the hall with my girl, and we had spent a long time wandering about hand in hand when we suddenly came on the remains of a machine. It stood about six feet in height, and I could see that at one time it had been of great complexity. For some reason, my girl was not very interested and went off to see something else. But I found that this particular machine made me feel very sad. It appeared to be entirely composed of needles of metal, arranged in a thick pattern. The largest of these needles was about three inches long, and there appeared to be no way for the machine to hold together. My guess is that when it was made, the needles were fitted in such a way that the whole thing struck an internal balance. The machine was now little more than a gossamer web of rust. It must have had tremendous stability to have remained standing for such a long time. It was fascinating to look closely at its construction to see the red lines fitting together so densely. It was like looking into a labyrinth, a system of blood-red caves. With every movement of my head, a whole new landscape was presented to me. I called my girl over and we stood hand in hand, looking at the dead machine. I think that it must have been our body heat, for neither of us made an excessive movement. But at that moment, the entire construction creaked and sank a few inches. Then there was a sigh, and the whole thing dissolved into dust about our feet. Both of us felt very subdued when we left the hall. I hope that the above information has enabled you to gain an impression of this very exciting hall. There is little that I can add except for the following point. You will remember from one of the accounts I gave you, the one giving the tales of the creation of new machines, the following passages. It is a small mechanism on caterpillar tracks with various appendages at its front end which seem to be designed for working metal or stone. It appears to create only two kinds of machine. One appears to be made for erection, the other for demolition. These two passages, together with some other material that I have not published, suggest an interesting point. I believe that the machines mentioned here are the same as those described in another account in which the writer stood by one of the outer walls of the hall. He watched one set of machines building a wall about six inches further out than the old wall, which was being torn down by the other mechanisms. This seems to be a process which is going on all the time, all over the hall. A new wall is built slightly further out, and this, in turn, will be demolished as another wall is put up. I believe that the hall has been, from the time of its creation, and always will be, increasing in size. However, only more research will be able to establish this radical idea as an incontrovertible fact. The story tonight was The Hall of the Machines, from the book The Eye of the Lens, by Langdon Jones. This is Michael Hansen speaking. Production engineering for Mindwebs by Steve Gordon. Mindwebs is a production of WHA Radio in Madison, a service of University of Wisconsin Extension.
half hour to kill. Your company, makers of your products, present another study in murder and suspense. From the pen of Robert Webster Light comes Blackout, an unusual tale especially designed for your half hour to kill. And now we give you the eminent actor, Mr. William Conrad, in Blackout. Tell me, Mr. Police Commissioner, how long ago did life begin for you? Forty, forty-five years ago? That's about right. Yeah. Well, for me, life began about 24 hours ago. Yeah, that's all. 24 hours ago, I woke up. I was lying in a ditch beside a railroad track. When I first opened my eyes, I saw the sky. It was clear and very blue. And I sat up and I saw that my knee was sticking out through a hole in my pants and that my clothes were dirty and torn. And I started thinking, wait a minute, what's happened to me? I rubbed my eyes like you'll do when you first wake up and my hand ran across something sticky. And I looked at my hand and it was blood, dry, sticky blood. I didn't get it. I didn't get it at all. In the distance, I could see a train. Could I have fallen off it or been thrown off? Then a guy started walking toward me. He looked like a bum. I could see him quite a ways off. Hi there, young fellow. Yeah? You hurt? No, I'm all right. What's the matter? Nothing. I'm all right. It's dizzy, I guess. You've been kind of banged around. You bumped off the rods? I, I don't know. But how'd you be here in the ditch if you wasn't bumped off the rods? I don't know, I tell you. Okay, Pete, okay. My name isn't Pete. Well, I just call everybody that. What is your name? My name is... Wait, my, my, my name is... Well? I, I can't remember my name. You can't remember? Are you kidding what are you trying to pull? Don't know your own name. I tell you, it's true. I don't know. I can't remember. It ain't so easy to forget your own name, Pete. Look, don't ride me, will you? Something's happened. I don't know just what, but something's wrong. Where are you from? What? Where are you from? I, I don't know that either. I, I just can't remember. It's so crazy. Say, you really got it bad, ain't you, Joe? Uh, let's see now. I... I... No, no, it's no use. Well, look in your pockets. Maybe you'll find something with your name on it. Yeah, yeah, that's an idea. Let's see. Here's a handkerchief. Some keys. Any money? No, no money. Anything with your name on it? No, I can't find a thing. How about a wallet? Look in your coat pocket. Oh, nothing. My inside coat pocket's been torn, you see? It's like the wallet's been torn right out. Yeah. You probably had a fight and lost it. Uh, it's hopeless. What am I going to do? If I was you, the first thing I'd do is try to find out who I am. That's kind of important. Yeah. I seen the train pass through, the train you fell off of. It was coming from Chicago. Chicago? Yeah. It ain't far back. I'd get there if I was you and start asking questions. Then I'd get myself to a hospital. You don't look good, Pete. You don't look good at all. <laughs> Yes, Mr. Commissioner, that's how it started, with loss of memory, amnesia. I was bad enough, but I, if I'd known how much bigger and more terrible my problems were going to be, I'd never have come back to Chicago. Never. Well, I hitchhiked in, and when I saw how people were looking in my torn clothes, I thought I'd better pay a visit to a tailor. Good afternoon. Come in. Thank you. I... Such a beautiful day, I don't feel like working already. But when it's got to be, it's got to be. What can I do for you? Well, my clothes... Are... Such a mess. You had an accident? Yeah, I'm afraid I did. What's the matter with me? Sit down, sit down. You look terrible. You could use a little drink? Some brandy, maybe? No, thanks. I, I feel okay now. I'd just like to have these clothes sewn up and pressed a little. Could uh, you do it while I wait? Certainly, and with pleasure. 
Look, go into the back room. Throw the clothes through the door. You'll find a wash basin. You can wash that cut on your face. That, that's very kind of you. Uh, there's only one thing. Yes? I, I'm flat broke. I, I couldn't pay you for them now. Maybe in a day or so. All right. A day or so. A week or so. Go on and make yourself at home. And while you're washing up, I'll mend the pants and get them in first class shape. So I went out of the tailor's little back room and took off my suit. Then I went over to the washstand and started to wash. My head felt better as soon as I got a little cool water on it. I sat down and I tried to figure, what would I do? Where would I go from here? And then I noticed something about my pants belt. It, it was bulky. It had a little zipper in the back. And when I opened it, money started falling out in tight rolls. The bills were crisp and new. And I thought my heart was beating loud enough for the tailor to hear it as I counted the money. It was $50,000. Hey, mister. Are you coming with the clothes? Huh? Oh, oh, yeah, yeah, they're ready. I'll hand them to you through the door. Good. I'll have them fixed up like new in no time. You sit there and relax. You look like you could stand it. Yeah, relax. Relax with 50,000 bucks strapped around my stomach. Well, the little tailor fixed my clothes, and I looked fairly respectable again. You know, I never seen such nice material in a long time as that suit. Is that so? Yes, it cost a beautiful dollar, believe me. Where did you get it? Where? Why, uh, why, wasn't there a label on it? No, the label had been ripped off. <laughs> so why am I asking so many questions? Goodbye and good luck. Uh, what do I owe you? So when you earn a few dollars, come back and we'll figure out. Will this do it? What? Twenty dollars? But before you said you were broke. This I don't understand. <laughs> that makes two of us, my friend. You can imagine how I felt, can't you, Mr. Commissioner? I didn't know what to do, where to turn. I thought of going to the police, but... Something in my subconscious warned me against it. When the little tailor had fixed my clothes and I looked fairly respectable again, I went out on the street and began walking. I didn't know where I was going or why. Fifty thousand bucks. I tried with every ounce of strength to crush through the wall that separated me from the past, but it was no use. I must have walked for miles because... Suddenly it was dark, and I was on a dismal little side street lined with hock shops and hamburger joints and honky-tonks. And then some punk kid brushed against me. Hey, mister. Huh? You better fade fast. What? You're being tailed. What do you mean? Not so loud, not so loud. A guy's been following you for the last hour. Following me? Relax. Don't get so jumpy. Boy, you must really be hot. Now look into this window. You can see his reflection. The tall, skinny guy in the white suit. Yeah, I see him. How do you know he's been following me? Because I've been walking a little behind you ever since you turned down 14th Street. And I can tell when a guy's being tailed. Why are you telling me, then? Because maybe you'll be big-hearted and slip me a bill for it. And because maybe I don't like cops. Cops? Sure. Sure he's a cop. I can tell him a mile away. Yeah... You must really be hot, mister. It's easy to say now that I know what I should have done, Mr. Commissioner. I should have gone up to this guy and had a showdown right then and there, but panic is a funny thing. It begins almost before you know it, and there's no cure for it. No cure at all. I began running as fast as I could, and I brushed against people, and I stumbled, and I didn't stop until my wind gave out, and my legs weighed a ton. Then I looked back, and I'd lost my friend in the white suit. But for how long? I had to find a place to sleep that night. I saw this little hotel on Side Street. I straightened my tie and wiped the sweat off of my face and started through the lobby. There was no one at the desk. I rang the desk bell. A little fellow with glasses came out. Yeah? I I'd like a room. Uh, rates are a dollar and a half. In advance. Yeah, that's all right. No luggage, huh? 
No, no, I, I'm just staying over there. Oh, that's all right. Very few of them bring any luggage. What's your name? What? <laughs> what are you getting so excited about? Just want your name for the hotel registers, huh? My name? Uh, the name's Bronson. Yeah, Howard Bronson. Uh, Howard Bronson. I thought for a minute you were going to say you were one of the Smith boys. <laughs> Here's the key, Mr. Bronson. Okay. And now it's the dollar and a half. Yeah, yeah, here you are. Twenty, though? Is that the smallest you have? That's all I have, yeah. Well, then I suppose I can change it. You sure it's good? You didn't make it yourself now, did you? It's good. <laughs> no offense, no offense. Just my own little joke. Okay, uh, take another nickel out for this newspaper. Sure thing, sure thing. Uh, here's your change. Now, why don't you go up to bed? You look very tired. I tried to sleep, but it was no use. Why had that man in the white suit followed me? What had I done? Not knowing, not knowing almost drove me out of my mind. Out of my mind. I was already out of my mind. Then finally, I must have dozed off because I was suddenly in the middle of a terrible nightmare. Oh. Oh. No, oh, I won't give it up. I won't. Stay out of here. Leave me alone. Leave me alone. Leave me alone, Bailey. Bailey. Mr. Bronson. Mr. Bronson. What? Are you all right, Mr. Bronson? Yes. Yes, I'm all right. Who is it? It's the room clerk. Would you open the door for a moment? Yeah. Come in. Several of the guests heard you scream, and we wondered if... Oh, it was... it was nothing, just a nightmare, I guess. I'm all right now, I think. Uh, I'm glad to hear that. Uh, is that all you wanted to know? Uh, not exactly. Well? A detective came in a while ago, inquiring about somebody. Detective? Yeah, a city detective. Well, that is, according to the badge he showed me. What did he want? Oh, no one named Bronson. Well, then what are you bothering me for? It wasn't Bronson he asked for, but his description of the man fitted you exactly. How, how long ago was he here? Oh, about 20 minutes ago. Your name is Bronson. Yeah, yeah, sure. Well, you know it's technically against the law to register under an alias. My name's Bronson. Okay, okay. I just wanted to make sure that's so. all. He must have wanted somebody else. He says he's been checking up in all the hotels in this neighborhood. Says he might drop back later. What... Did he look like? Most tall fella, kind of slim, wearing a white summer suit. White summer suit? Uh, don't see many of those nowadays, do you? No, no, no. You sure you're over your nightmare? Right? Yeah, I'm, I'm all right. Yeah, well, okay. Well, good night, Mr. Brown. Uh, good night. Oh, uh, say, uh... Yeah? If that fella does come back... Uh, the detective? Yeah, yeah, if he does come back, let me know. I just want both... Him and you to make sure that I'm not the one he's looking for. Oh, yes. <laughs> and okay, Mr. Bradley. Good night. After that, I didn't want to sleep. I got very jittery. And I paced the room and smoked one cigarette after another. Why had I said that to the clerk? I couldn't be so lily white with that 50 grand strapped to me. Still, maybe it'd be better to have it out with a guy once and for all. Finally, I forced myself to sit down. I picked up the paper and started to read. The front page was filled with news and names that meant nothing to the shadow that had engulfed my mind. But down in the corner of the front page, what was this? A detective flying on a train. Detective flying on a train? George Bailey, Chicago... De Bailey, the man in my nightmare was found dead this morning in a roomette on a westbound train. Police officials report that he was on the trail of one Joe Latterly, who was believed to have killed the detective during an attempted arrest. Police throughout the state are on the lookout for Latterly now. He is known to be carrying $50,000 in stolen currency. $50,000 in stolen currency? Now what was I going to do? I was not only a thief, I was a killer. But funny thing, somehow I didn't feel like a killer. I didn't feel like a killer at all. Mr. Bronson, that detective came back. He's here with me now. He'd uh, like to talk to you. 
Detective? Oh, yeah, sure. Be, be glad to talk to him. Wait just one second. I'll throw on some clothes. No, thank you. I wasn't having any of this. The only thing I could think about was getting away. I rushed to the window and raised it. And the fire escape led right down to the back alley. Open up, Mr. Burton! I slid over the sill and started down the fire escape, and as I raced down the steps, I heard excited voices above me, and then... They were shooting at me. This was a new sensation, Mr. Commissioner. Not exactly the most pleasant feeling in the world. Well, that convinced me. I was the killer. The killer at bay. Act two of Half Hour to Kill will follow in just a moment. But first, turn over the record. And now, back to Blackout. A story especially designed for your... Half hour to kill. What could I do? Where could I go? It was almost midnight. There was not one person in the whole world that I could turn to that I knew. I didn't even know my own name. Hey, wait a minute, wait a minute. Yes, yes, I did know my own name. Joe Latterly. The newspaper said Joe Latterly. I saw an all-night drugstore down the block. I just about ran all the way. I closed myself in the phone booth and started thumbing through the directory. Sure enough, there it was. Joe Latterly. I wrote down my address and began dialing my telephone number. While the number rang, I saw the cold sweat come rolling down my face and neck and soak into my collar. Hello? Hello, this is the Latterly residence? Yeah. What do you want? This is Joe. Joe? Yeah. Don't sound like it. I had a little accident. Did you get the money? Yeah. Any trouble? I... I, I killed him. Oh. Look, I better see you right away. Yeah. Well, don't come here. The cops are thick as flies. Better meet me at the usual place. The usual place? Yeah, at Mom's. Okay, at Mom's. Uh, look, this accident kind of mussed up my memory. Uh, what's Mom's address again? 229. 229. 9th Street, apartment 204. Oh, yeah, apartment 204. Okay, I'll see you there. You sure sound funny, Joe. What happened? I'll tell you all about it when I see you. So I had a wife, and she was in on everything. You see, Commissioner, the jigsaw puzzle was beginning to make some sense now. A wife, and I couldn't even remember the color of her hair. If only I could break through the shadow. Well, ten minutes later, I was standing in the entrance of a very classy apartment hotel lobby. Not a soul in sight. I began looking down the list of numbers for the right doorbell to ring. I felt myself going shaky again. There it was, 204. I pushed the bell, waited, and then the door buzzer sounded and I pushed the door open and started across the lobby. No one in sight. No one. That was a break. I pulled my hat down over my eyes as I started up the steps. You see, I, I was beginning to think like a hunted man, like a killer. I took the stairs to the second floor and then started down the hall. 200, 202, the next door, 204. The door was ajar. I wanted to call my wife, but what was her name? Honey? Honey, are you there? No answer. I pushed the door open. The room was in darkness. I felt along the wall for a light switch and found it. And there waiting for me was this detective, this tall, skinny guy in the white suit. I let my nerves take over. I jumped from the room, slammed the door shut, and started running again. This time he had a better chance at me than before. As I ran through the empty streets, I could hear him coming right behind me. I ducked down alleys and across backyards, but he was right on my tail. I couldn't run much farther. I was all pooped out. And then I bumped smack into somebody. Hey, 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 watch where you're going. I, I didn't see you, officer. Well, I'm not exactly an officer. I'm a night watchman. But who are you running from? Why, why, nobody. Nobody at all. 
I looked up and down the dark street. The detective was nowhere in sight. I don't know. You weren't exactly strolling along. Come over here to the street light. Let me take a look at you. Hmm. Well, if, if, if you must know, I I got into a little jam with a, a lady. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, so that's it. Yeah, well, the way you run, I bet you're a hard man to catch. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, yeah. Well, go on, go on with you and be more careful next time. You may not always get a head start. Huh? Yeah, I guess you're right. <laughs> well, good night, dear. Oh, uh, yeah? I live on the other side of town. What's the quickest way to get home? Well, there's an elevated train station two blocks from here. That's your best bet. Okay. Yeah, uh, but you better hurry. The last train pulls in at one o'clock, and it's pretty close to that right now. Uh, I'll hurry. Good night. I began walking again. Once I got away from this neighborhood, I have a chance. A chance for what? Well, I wasn't sure, but a man with 50,000 bucks could do a lot of maneuvering. I saw the lights of the elevated station ahead, and in the quiet night, I heard the rumble of the approaching train. The last train. I started jogging. I couldn't miss that train. I took a quick glance over my shoulder. It was him again, my friend in the white suit. I raced up the steps three at a time. When I got to the top, he was at the bottom. Stop or I'll kill you! I'd never heard a deadlier sound than that voice. There was no one else on the elevated platform. Even the ticket seller had closed up shop and put a little sign on his window, pay on train. And the last train was just pulling in. The detective was coming up the stairs. Kind of slow for some reason that I didn't have time to figure out. The train stopped and the door swung open and I got in. The door closed and the train was on its way. I looked back and the detective was standing on the platform just looking at the train. I didn't get it. Why hadn't he come after me? I couldn't figure it. Then I decided I'd better get some information from the conductor. Say, uh, could, could you help me? Yeah, sure. What do you want to know? Oh, where does this train go? 190th. 190th. Yeah. Uh, can I get to the state highway from there? Nope. You're going the opposite way. <laughs> Kind of got mixed up my directions, I guess. Well, the only way to get where you're going is to take another car back to the loop. That was what I wanted to know. I decided to get off on a block or two in case the cop was waiting for me at 190th. He must have figured he could beat me there and would probably have quite a little reception committee waiting. So I got up and started to walk to the door. Hey. Yeah? Where are you going? Well, you said I was going the wrong way. I was going to get off the next stop. You can't get off till 190th. This is an express. <laughs> I was just about ready to crack. I knew it would be curtains for me as soon as I got off the train. I kept hoping for a miracle. Maybe the train would crack up or stop one station too soon, but it was no use. Finally, the conductor called the station. 190th Street. 190th Street. And a half dozen sleepy passengers started getting up and heading for the doors. Then I got an idea. Maybe I could stay in the car. Maybe I could wait. When the last passenger got out, the conductor looked over at me. Is this where you transfer back to the loop? Uh, where does the train go? Up a few blocks and we turn around and head back. What, couldn't I go back with you? Sorry, you got to get out of here and cross the bridge. But I... Uh... I don't make the rules, buddy. The company makes them for me. Well, I tell you that... Hey. What's the matter? There's somebody behind you. Just come with me. I've got a gun right against your back. It was him. I felt the gun rubbing against my spine. And I knew I had only one chance. So I whipped around. I was lucky. I caught him with a hard right and he went down. I jumped fast and got his service revolver. He didn't stay down long, though, and as he got up and lunged at me, I let him have it. Right between the eyes. So there's my story, Mr. Police Commissioner. I'm Joe Latterly. I've killed two cops. One today and one last week. I stole 50,000 bucks. And I'm tired of the whole thing. I'm glad it's over. Well, that's quite a story, mister. I don't suppose you remember how or why Detective Bailey was killed last week on that train out of Chicago. No. Well, we've constructed the crime pretty well, we think. It began a week ago when a fellow named Steve Roycroft came to headquarters with a complaint against one of his employees. He suspected him of embezzling $50,000. And that employee was... Joe Latterly. I see. Latterly disappeared, and Detective Bailey was assigned to the case. Later that day, he found Latterly taking the morning train out of Chicago. 
called Roycroft and told him about it. Both Roycroft and Bailey made the train on Latterly's trail. They confronted him and got back the 50 grand. Well, who got the money back? Well, the man it rightfully belonged to. Steve Roycroft. Well, then where did Just I... Just a minute. Roycroft got his money back, but Latterly made another try. He overpowered Detective Bailey and killed him. Would have killed Roycroft, too, but Roycroft jumped for his life from the speeding train. Oh, wait a minute. Wait a minute. You got it wrong. I jumped from the train, remember? Exactly. But... You're not Joe Latterly, my friend. You're Steve Roycroft. When you got your money and jumped from the train, you lost your memory. Then when you read that we were looking for the killer Latterly, you naturally assumed that you were him. Of course, we thought Latterly still had the money. Good heaven. What's the matter now? What, don't you realize what I've done? What? Thinking I was Joe Latterly, I, I killed a detective who was trying to bring me in. Detective? Yes, just now on the elevated platform. That wasn't a detective at all. What? Well, then who? He was Joe Latterly, trying to get back his money, or I should say, your money. Joe Latterly? That's right. And there won't be any charges. You killed him in self-defense. Yes, the man in the white suit was Joe Latterly all the time. That's why you met him in that apartment. It was his hideout. <sighs> I know this has been a great shock to you, Mr. Roycroft. Shock? <laughs> yeah. You're not well. You need rest. I've sent for an ambulance to take you to the hospital. The psychiatrist there will be able to help you recover your memory. I hope so. <laughs> I hope they can make me forget what I thought I was. How do you mean? I've lived the life of Joe Latterly too well. Done something to me. i begun to think like he must have thought. Like a hunted killer. <laughs> Not going to be easy to return to the commonplace routine existence of Steve Roycroft after what I've been through. I hope I won't become too bored, Mr. Commissioner. <laughs> Next week at the same time over the same stations, your company, makers of your products, will present Death on Highway 99. Another unusual tale especially designed for your... A power to kill. Half Hour to Kill is written and produced by Robert Webster Light. Original music is composed and conducted by Henry Russell. Mr. William Conrad, recently featured in Mark Hellinger's production, The Killers, was supported in tonight's presentation by an all-star Hollywood cast, including Peggy Weber, Norman Field, Howard McNear, Ken Christie, Paul Fries, and Byron Kane. This is a Telaways feature, produced in Hollywood for audition purposes only. October is the anniversary of Weird Darkness, and we celebrate by raising funds to help people who suffer from depression. Chantel wrote in saying, I had fairly aggressive postpartum depression three years ago. I work as a reservist in the Canadian Armed Forces and full-time as a correctional officer. I didn't know about the Weird Darkness podcast when I was dealing with my postpartum. However, due to my past medical history and my two jobs that almost guarantee me to have some type of mental illness in the future, I am glad that there is a soft place to fall other than the usual government-funded sites." Chantel is right. The organizations that we're raising funds for this month, Seven Cups, iFred, and the National Suicide and Crisis Lifeline are all funded by donors like you and me who understand the importance of these resources being available. You can make a donation now of any amount by visiting WeirdDarkness.com slash overcoming. That's WeirdDarkness.com slash overcoming. Or click the link in the show notes. Good evening. I'm Mr. Barrett, one of the characters in the Molo, Mole Mystery Theater, which follows right away. I just want to remind you that although next winter seems very far away, right now is the time to do something about next winter's heating problem. 
The government says that fuel of all types is going to be scarce, so if you want to keep warm, you should go to your dealer now and get whatever kind and quantity of fuel he can let you have. Also, you should check up on all your heating equipment and make sure that you're not wasting fuel. And lastly, protect your home against loss of heat by installing insulation and weather stripping. Those are the ways in which you can protect your home against next winter's cold. And now, the Mole Mystery Theater, presented by M-O-L-L-E. Mole, the brushless shaving cream that guards your tender skin with its special protective film. Good evening, ladies and gentlemen. This is Jeffrey Barnes welcoming you to the program that presents the best in mystery and detective fiction. Tonight we bring you an unusual tale of the supernatural by Oliver Onions entitled The Beckoning Fair One. It is a gripping study in human terror, the eerie story of a strange rebellion and the terrible consequences that followed. So here it is, The Beckoning Fair One. My name is Paul Oleron. I'll tell it from the beginning, just the way it happened. I don't ask you to believe it. Just listen. I was working on my new novel, Romilly, when I decided to move. I looked over a couple of places and finally discovered one I liked. Of course, it's not a new house, Mr. Oleron, but we'll do the place over for you any color you like. They're certainly quaint-looking rooms, aren't they? Plenty of atmosphere here. <laughs> you writers will have your atmosphere. Uh, are you sure you won't reconsider about uh, taking the whole house, I mean? Mm. Hey, you never know who might rent the other floors, you know. If you don't mind my saying so, Mr. Barrett, you're not likely to have many people interested in living in this old relic. Oh, it's not as bad as all that. But I rather like the idea of being the only tenant in this venerable mansion. Huh? Just as you like, Mr. Oleron. Leave it to me, Mr. Barrett. I'll make my corner of it cozy enough. <laughs> I was thoroughly pleased with my new quarters. There was an air of ancient charm about the place that appealed to my imagination. Then I discovered the handle in the window seat. That meant there was a box underneath. But the lid was stuck. I went to work on it with mallet and chisel. Paneling rang and vibrated. The whole house seemed to echo. Finally, I loosened the lid and tried it out. I drew out something soft and yielding, covered with dust. It was some kind of a large bag, triangular in shape. It had wide flaps and buckles. I couldn't imagine what it had been used for. Soon lost interest in it, depositing it in a corner of the room. Then I set about removing a large nail from the bottom of the lid. I spent the rest of the afternoon putting my manuscripts into the box. In the evening, Elsie Bengo paid me a visit. Elsie worked on a newspaper, and she was always enthusiastic over my work, especially the new novel, Robert. Well, Elsie, what do you think of the place? Oh, I don't know, Paul. I like the last place. In spite of the black ceiling and no water tap. How's Romney coming? Uh... Not very well. Are you stuck? Yep. Can't seem to get on with it. Paul, would you like to read me some of it? You don't understand, Elsie. I haven't done any more on it. Not a line. Paul, you're joking. Ah. Perfectly serious. I'm even considering scrapping the whole 15 chapters and starting over. Making Romilly a different type of woman. You're really going to scrap those 15 chapters? You seem more concerned about it than I am. Well, maybe I am. You've got what you've been working for almost within your reach. A novel that'll make you famous. You have a lot of confidence in Romilly, don't you? And now you just want to scrap the whole thing. Paul, it's unforgivable. Oh, it's a different thing. The important thing is I'm happier here than I've been for a long time. <laughs> I'm sorry. I, I didn't mean to let you with this. But I feel so close to Romilly. It's 
thing in the corner here? Suppose you tell me. Why, it's a harp cover. What? It's a harp cover. It's been used to wrap up a harp before putting it into its case. Oh, it must be a very old one. Well, thanks for solving my mystery. Paul? Hmm? Paul, who lives in the rest of this house? Nobody. I'm the only tenant. Paul? Yes? May I tell you frankly what I feel about this place? By all means. You'll never work here. <laughs> why on earth not? I don't know why. But you'll never finish Romilly here. <laughs> That night, I sat by my fire, pondering over Elsie's prophecy. I looked around the room. It filled me with a sense of calm I'd never known before. The more I thought about Elsie Bengo, the more I became convinced I would have to destroy those 15 chapters. Unwittingly, I'd put too much of Elsie into my character of Romilly. And those qualities I disliked in Elsie Bengo... I found objectionable in Romilly. Then I became aware of the dripping water tap in the kitchen. It had a tinkling range of three notes on which it seemed to play a tune. In my mind's eye, I could see the gathering of each drop, the little tremble on the lip of the tap, and the tiny musical sound of its fall. I found myself waiting to hear each drop over and over again. Ah, mm. uh, uh, come in. Good morning, Mr. Oleron. Have a good night, Oh, the best, Miss Grayson, the best. You sure I'm not putting you out any, asking you to come over every morning and get my breakfast? <laughs> I don't mind it a bit. What's a caretaker's wife for if not to take care of things? <laughs> da, ba, ba, da. You hear me? But that's a very old tune, Mr. Oleron. I haven't heard it in these 40 years. Hmm? What tune? Oh, the one you come in. It's called the Beckon and Fair one. Really? Uh, sing it for me. Dear me, I haven't got any voice, but if you want, it went something like this. Very, very pretty. <laughs> they do say it was sung to a harp. The tune must be at least a hundred years old. And, and I was humming it? <laughs> Indeed you were. <laughs> this is odd. I, I thought I heard that tune last night, dripping from the kitchen faucet. Oh. <laughs> uh, Silly idea. A faucet singing. As time passed, I became more and more attached to my apartment. But Elsie Bengo did not share my enthusiasm. It just doesn't belong to today at all, Paul. No, this is a dead house. Everything in it reeks of decay. That's all in the point of view, isn't it, Elsie? Is Romilly coming any better? I think she is. I'm laying the foundations of her new character. I'll begin the actual writing soon. You mean you discarded the old Romilly? Yes. Oh, where's the manuscript? In the window box. What do you want it for? I want to read you something. I'll bring you back to your senses. Maybe you'll hear someone else read. Oh! What's the matter, Elsie? Nail out of the lid, Paul. But I thought I did. Oh, oh here, let me bandage it. Please don't worry about it, Paul. It's running over scratch. Look what you walked me down to the bus. It'll do you good to get out for a breath of fresh air. I, I can't, Elsie. I really must get down to work. No. No, that isn't why you won't go out. Oh, Paul, move out of here. Everything's wrong with this place. Oh, Elsie, please. Let me see you to the door. Help me. Step. I put my foot through. Oh, you poor girl. It's so funny. 
Elsie. Elsie. Yeah. There's this nail and now this step. Oh, oh, Lord, it's so funny. Elsie, let me help you. No. No, don't let me go. Elsie. Please, please let me go away. I'm not wanted here. <laughs> Alone that night before my fireplace, I found myself considering Elsie's two accidents. I thought I'd removed that nail from the lid of the window box. But then I couldn't be too certain I hadn't left a bit of it still in the wood. And the staircase was an old one. Though it seemed strong enough to me, the step might have collapsed under anybody. Poor Elsie simply happened to be the victim. Oh, my imagination was beginning to play tricks with me. I actually fancied I heard my name in the sound of the dripping water tap. Oh, I, I laughed at myself. That's what came of too much thinking. Suddenly, I stopped laughing. I heard a rustling sound. It seemed to be coming from the center of the room. For a moment, I couldn't identify it. A long, sweeping sound. Faint cracking in it. What is it? What's there? Who's there? That sound. It's a woman. Combing her hair. I've got to get out of here. <laughs> Fled the house. I walked for hours in the cold, clear night. Gradually, my fear left me. I began to laugh at myself. Of course I hadn't removed that nail. Of course the wood in that step had been rotted through. As for the invisible woman brushing her hair, I'd been dreaming too much, that was all. It was morning by the time I got back to the house. I hadn't been to bed at all. I was tired. I found Mrs. Grayson, the caretaker's wife, waiting for me in my room. The liberty of coming in, Mr. Oran, seeing as the door was open and you weren't home. I've, I've been out for a walk. You needn't bother about breakfast this morning, Miss Grayson. I'm not hungry. From now on, Mr. Oran, you'll have to make other arrangements for getting your breakfast. What? I won't be setting foot inside your door again. Well, why? What's the matter? I'm a respectable woman, and I'll not be serving a man who makes a habit of entertaining ladies in his room. Ladies? I'll make your bed for you this last time. Make up my bed? That's a good one. I, I haven't been to bed yet. I haven't been here all night. No. Well, somebody spent the night here, Mr. Oleron, because your bed's been slept in. Well, Mr. Fang. Do you think Paul Oleron's house is really haunted? Or is he bewitched by his own imagination? And is there anything he can do to save himself? Yes, Mr. Barnes, there is. Listen to me. I was once bewitched, but I was saved by a magic word. A magic word? What word? Listen. My face was bewitched. Every time I shaved, I used to get invisible little nicks and scrapes. But then I learned the magic word. Mole! <laughs> well, gentlemen, there is something magical about the way Mole protects your face against irritating little nicks and scrapes. But there's a common sense reason behind it. You see, Mole has a special protective film, a slick, smooth, moist film with more real body and substance than light, fluffy cream. Mole gives your razor something to ride on. Your razor rides along smoothly from the first stroke to the last without pulling or tugging at your whiskers. And then, your tender skin gets the very best of protection against aftershave burn and irritation. Mole is made with ingredients of assured quality. Ingredients that meet the official U.S. pharmacopoeia requirements for medical purity. So, gentlemen, try Mole. The brushless shaving cream that puts face protection first. 
And now back to Jeffrey Barnes and Act Two of The Beckoning Fair One. Paul Oleron, writer, had not been in his new living quarters long before strange things began to happen. Nails put themselves back into the wood. A leaking water tap played an old tune, and an invisible woman appalled Oleron's soul by combing her hair. He has just returned to his rooms after spending the night walking the streets and contemplating the beckoning fair one. I looked at the rumpled bed. The sheets bore a distinct impression as if somebody had lain on them. I knew that I hadn't been near the bed since Mrs. Grayson had made it the day before. I was face to face with it now. Something inhabited my room. But what? I was seized with a desire to know the thing. Find out what it was. I lay down on the bed and tried to figure it out. But it's becoming clear to me now that the key lay in my half-written novel, Romilly. Or rather, in both Romillys. The old one and the proposed new one. Looking back over it, I realized there was almost passionate hatred in the way the new Romilly had supplanted the old. Somehow, all this was related to Elsie Bengo. One thing was certain. Elsie must not come inside this house again. That afternoon, I saw her coming up the walk. I hurried to meet her outside. I'm sorry, Elsie. I, I'm just going out. I've got an appointment downtown. You want to walk along with me? Paul, you haven't any appointment. You just don't want me in the house. Well, I only wanted to tell you that everything's over between us. What, well, Elsie? Let me tell you, Paul. Something strange is happening to you. Please, Elsie. But if you ever... If you ever need me, Paul, somehow I'll know it. And then I'll come. Sorry to bother you, Mr. Perhaps there's something I've got to ask you. Oh, I'm glad to be of help, I can. Uh, yes. uh, as renting agent of a house, you'd know something about the previous tenant, wouldn't you? Uh, yes. The last tenant in your rooms was an artist by the name of Madley. He uh, seldom went out of the place. As a matter of fact, Madley died there under uh, rather peculiar circumstances. Yes. Uh, it was discovered at the post-mortem that there wasn't a particle of food in his stomach. Starved to death? Oh, starved to death, all right. Only it wasn't because he didn't have any money. You see, they found a bank book in his room proving he had $10,000 in a New York bank. Suicide, then? By starvation. Hmm? It's rather an uncommon form of suicide, isn't it? Then... Why? Why? I don't know, Mr. Oran. Nobody ever found out. I returned to the house. That there was a strange presence there, I was convinced. And now that I'd rid myself of Elsie, Bengo, who'd been the old inspiration for the character Romilly in my novel, I hoped to meet the beckoning fair one. She who was becoming the new inspiration. Once inside, I had to be calm. Convinced her that I didn't care whether she appeared or not. I lit a candle in the bedroom, drew down the blind, took off my coat, and stooped to get my slippers from under the bed. I straightened up. Reflected in the mirror, I saw a gleam of light in the center of the room. It moved up and down through the air. It was the reflection of the candle on my comb. And each of its downward movements was accompanied by a silky, crackling rustle. I went into the living room and returned with the manuscript of the old Romilly. The combing stopped immediately. I was no longer aware of the fair one's presence. As I thought, she's just jealous. Jealous. <laughs> Mm -hmm. 
Night after night passed. Still, I did not see her. My life became one passionate and consuming desire to see the new Romilly, the new heroine of my novel, who had fastened herself on my brain in the guise of the beckoning fair one. Yes, sir. What can I do for you? I want a bouquet of roses. Yes, sir. Got the beauties today. Beauties for a beautiful lady, huh? Here's a nice bouquet. That one will do. Nothing like roses to win the heart of the fair one, eh? <laughs> What'd you say? Uh, uh, I was just making conversation. You said something about the fair one. Oh, just a manner of speaking, sir. I didn't mean any offense. Oh, of course not. I, I'm sorry. I'll take this flowers now. And I want you to deliver a bouquet of these to my house every morning for the next two weeks. <laughs> I'd made the arrangements with the florist so I wouldn't have to leave the house at all. I hoped the flowers would unbend her coy, stubborn will. They did no good. I lost track of the days. I walked through my rooms with slippered feet now, treading softly, afraid of frightening her away. I kept the windows shut and the crimson blinds down. In this enticing, flower-laden place, I waited for the beckoning fair one. searched my mind for some reason why she held herself back from me. Suddenly it came to me. The manuscript of the old Romilly, those 15 chapters. I was a fool to think that the new Romilly would show herself to me as long as there existed evidence of my former attachment. I took the manuscript from the window box and was about to throw it into the fire. No! Who's, who's there? It's Elsie. Go away. I, I can't see you now. Please let me in, Paul. No. Paul, you're in trouble. I know you are. I'm all right. Go away. Paul, I only want to help. I promised I'd come if you needed me. Paul. Paul. Please answer me. Paul. I didn't answer. Paul. She was a fool. Coming here where she was not wanted. Why didn't she leave me alone? Her voice only irritated me. Soon her calling stopped. I heard her footsteps going down the stairs. Destroyed the manuscript of my old novel, Romilly, page by page. Then I lay down to wait again. How long, how many days, I don't know. I was beyond the world of calendars and clocks. Gradually, the strength drained from my body. I gazed vacantly at the star-patterned ceiling. Sometimes I had a fleeting recollection of a novel to be written... It was like something far off. Sometimes I thought about Madley, the previous tenant who had lived here before me, and I wondered... I wondered whether she had played her coy game with him. Paul. Uh, Paul. Elsie. How, how did you get in here? Paul, listen to me. You're not well, darling. Let me take care of you. I said I'd come when you needed me, Paul. Oh, wait. <laughs> she, she called my name. She's she here at last. Paul, what is it? I don't hear anything. No, no. Elsie, Elsie, get out. Quickly. No. No, I won't leave, Paul. Elsie, you must know. kill now, up here on the second floor, you've got four big rooms. Plenty of light and air. Certainly a quaint-looking place. Say, isn't this the part of the house where that writer lived? The one who's being executed tonight? <laughs> Yes, yes, this is it. What was the name of that girl he murdered? Elsie Bengo. Uh, of course, it's not a new house, but we'll be glad to do the place over for you. Uh, the water tap leaks uh, slightly, but it won't bother you. The 
And so we have heard how the strange voice of an unseen woman drove Paul Oleron to commit a murder. Yes, Mr. Barnes, the voice gave him evil advice. But now, listen to a voice that gives helpful advice. Mole, mole, mole puts face protection first. Yes, gentlemen, mole does put face protection first. It guards your face against annoying little nicks and scrapes because it's got a special protective film, a slick, smooth film with plenty of real body and substance. Mole gives your razor something to ride on. Your razor rides along smoothly from the first stroke to the last, and you get a close, clean shave without any pulling or tugging at your whiskers. You'll find that your shaves will get better, better, and better when you use M-O-L-L-E. Mole, the brushless shaving cream that puts face protection first. This is Jeffrey Barnes again, ladies and gentlemen, inviting you to be with us next week when we will bring you L.A.G. Strong's dramatic story of premeditated murder entitled Breakdown. A man is caught in the complicated web of a love triangle, which he realizes is slowly driving him insane. He attempts to solve his problem with a carefully planned murder, but it comes to a disastrous climax. So, mystery fans, be sure to listen next week to L.A.G. Strong's compelling adventure in crime... Breakdown. The original music for the Mole Mystery Theater is composed and conducted by Jack Miller. The Beckoning Fair One was written by Oliver Onions and adapted for radio by Eric Arthur. Until next Tuesday, this is Dan Seymour saying good night and good shaving with the brushless shaving cream that puts face protection first. Mole. Are Mole Hills Marlins to you? Are you too tired, too weary to face daily problems? Then listen. Doctors may find that your fatigue is caused by a borderline anemia. Yes, a borderline anemia resulting from a ferro-nutritional deficiency of the blood. Decide now to throw off depressing fatigue with the help of ironized yeast tablets. They're formulated to overcome borderline anemia by helping to build up red blood cells. Take IY, ironized yeast tablets, to get more vigor, more drive, more energy. This is the National Broadcasting Company. Murder Clinic, stories of the world's great detectives of fiction. Men Against Murder. Each week at this time, WOR Mutual turns the spotlight on one of the great figures of crime detection and brings you his most exciting case. Tonight, Agatha Christie's unique detective, Hercule Poirot, in the tragedy at Marsden Manor. Evening, Mr. Poirot. I'd recognize you anywhere, I think, thanks to those magnificent mustachios of yours. Merci bien. They are very magnificent, no? They are indeed. Now, tell me, did they help you solve the tragedy at Marsden Manor? Uh, no. It was the little gray cells in the brain of the great Hercule Poirot that prevented this great miscarriage of justice in the death of Richard Malfavre of Marsden Manor. It all began in the little village of Marsden Lee, less than a hundred kilometers from London. Coming, coming. 
Yes, yes, what is it? Be you Dr. Bernard? Yes, I am. Come quick, the master's done for. You mean Mr. Maltravers of the manor? Aye, the master. The mistress, she says, fetch the doctor, she says. But it be no use. He's a dead un. I knows a dead un when I see un. What was it, man? An accident? No, be no accident. I found him in the lower meadow, with the blood running out of his mouth. Be a stroke. A stroke? That's what it be. Well, hurry, man, hurry, man, let's go. Come, come now, Mrs. Beltravers. You must get hold of yourself. The Lord giveth and the Lord taketh away. After all, we are all of us mortal. But, but why, Richard? He was so good, so kind. Why did this have to happen to him? Oh, come, come, please. He seems so well, so full of life. Why, only last week he passed a medical examination for insurance. How could he have died so suddenly? Doctor, what happened? A hemorrhage. Due to stomach ulcers, undoubtedly, resulting in a stroke. Ah, bonjour, Mr. Hyde. Hello, Poirot. You know my good friend, Captain Hastings, no? Good morning, Captain Hastings. Good morning, sir. Well, Poirot, you got my message, I see. I did. What is it that disturbs you, mon ami? The Richard Maltravers dies. <laughs> you sent for Poirot. What was the cause of Monsieur Maltravers' death? The death certificate says a hemorrhage resulting in a stroke due to stomach ulcers. But surely you did not bring Papa Poirot here to talk of the stomach ulcers. <laughs> if Richard Maltravers had taken out the insurance policy in your company, no? And what a policy. For 50,000 pounds? Well, a good square sum, that, eh? Hmm. Rather. So, what is it you wish me to do? It is unfortunate for your company, but everything seems, uh, how you say... Uh, open and above the plank, no? <laughs> no, Puerro. Open and above board. Ah, my good friend, the great Hastings. Always he corrects the English of Hercule Poirot. <laughs> Monsieur Wright, I ask you, do I not speak the English of a, of a super? <laughs> you do indeed. But to get back to your previous question, what my company wishes you to do is to investigate the circumstances of Mr. Maltravers' death. So, what is it you suspect, mon ami? Well... Of course, you know, in the case of suicide, the policy is invalid. Yes. And when a man past the prime of life takes out an unusually large policy in favor of a young wife half his age and then dies within two weeks, the possibility of suicide cannot be ignored. Oh, it's certainly, mon ami. But suicide by hemorrhage? That is a queer saucepan of fish. Now, if the cause of death had been heart failure, ah, ah, then I would smell a mouse. Our failure can always mean that a, a stupid doctor did not find the true cause. But hemorrhage, ma foi, hemorrhage is, well, the, the, uh, hemorrhage. Exactly. <laughs> Nevertheless, we are determined to proceed with the matter. You will undertake the inquiry? But of course. Hastings, that great professor of English, shall go with me. <laughs> hey, mon ami? <laughs> Gladly, for Eh bien, now, where is this place, this Marsden Manor? You take the Great Eastern Line from Liverpool Station to the little town of Marsden Lee. Marsden Manor is about a mile from the village. Mm, Marsden Lee. All right, Hastings, we go. Ah, well, so this is Marsden Lee, eh? <laughs> I hope we can get a conveyance up to the manor. Ticket, ticket, sir. Ah, here you are, my friend. I suppose you'll be coming down for the funeral, sir. Funeral? Uh, what funeral? Uh, you say you made a funeral of Master Maltravers. About oh. the manor. Oh, uh, you said the manor. Uh, could that be Marsden Manor? Aye, it be. Oh, that is a odd coincidence. Uh, my friend and I, we have come down with a thought of uh, buying this Marsden Manor. You couldn't pay me to live there, you couldn't. Why not? It'd be haunted. Haunted? I haunted. Seen things there, folks says. Yeah, we shall see. Now, could you tell us where uh, Dr. Bernard lives? Aye, up yon hill, about half a mile. There. Come, Hastings. Hey, <laughs> 
I understand, Dr. Bernard, that you signed a death certificate of a Mr. Richard Malpravers. Yes, I did. You understand, Doctor, with such a big policy, we must make the careful investigation. Of course, of course. I suppose he was such a rich man, his life was insured for a big sum, hmm? You consider him a rich man, Doctor? Well, was he not? He kept two cars, you know, and Marsden Manor is a pretty big place to keep up. Mm. Although I believe he bought it very cheaply. I understand he had had uh, considerable losses of late. Mm, is that so? Indeed. Mm. It's fortunate for his widow, then, that there is this insurance. Yes, yes. Very beautiful and charming young creature, but terribly unstrung by this sad catastrophe. I've tried to spare her all I could, but of course the shock has been very great. Why shock? These ulcers of the stomach, uh, they are what uh, you call chronic, yes, eh? Yes, They are not sudden. No. Did mm. you not attend uh, Mr. Maltravers before, Doctor? My dear sir, I never attended him. What? I understand Mr. Maltravers was a member of a faith healing sect. But you examined the body? Certainly. I was fetched by one of the under gardeners. And the cause of death was clear? Absolutely. There was blood on the lips, but most of the bleeding must have been internal. He had not been moved? No. No, the body hadn't been touched. He had evidently been out shooting crows, and a long-barreled bird gun lay beside him. The hemorrhage must have occurred quite suddenly. Gastric ulcers, without a doubt. He could not have been shot, huh? My dear sir, I beg pardon. But I remember once a doctor who said heart failure until the constable showed him a bullet wound for the head. Mm, you mm. will find no bullet wounds on the body or head of Mr. Maltravers. Now, gentlemen, if there's nothing further, uh, I... Thank you, Doctor. Uh, uh, just one more thing. You saw no need for the autopsy, huh? Certainly not. The cause of death was perfectly clear. In my profession, we see no need to distress unduly the relatives of a dead patient. Now, gentlemen, if you'll pardon me, good day. Well, Hastings, what do you think of our good Dr. Bernal? <laughs> Bit of an old fool. Precisely. Your judgments of character are always profound, mon ami. Except where a young and beautiful woman is concerned. So now you must uh, mind your Q's and P's. Because the good doctor has said that the next one we see is both young and beautiful. This Madame Maltravers. <laughs> I cannot tell you how I am sorry to bother you in this way. Must I be bothered now? I know nothing about this insurance of my husband. Courage, madame. It is necessary. I will do all to make this matter not too unpleasant for you. I, Hercule Poirot, swear it. Now, if you would recount briefly the sad events of last Wednesday, huh? Well, I was changing for tea when the maid came up. One of the gardeners had just run up to the house. He'd found Richard. No, I can't point you end. Enough. <laughs> you had seen your husband earlier in the afternoon? No, not since lunch. I'd walked down to the village for some stamps. I believe he was out pottering around the grounds. Uh, shooting the crows, no? Yes, so I understand. He usually took his bird gun with him. In fact, I heard one or two shots at a distance. So? Where is this bird gun now? I, in the gun cabinet over there, I suppose. With your permission, madame. Yeah, here it is. Ah, two shots fired, I see. And now, madame, a delicate question. Monsieur Maltravers, your husband, is awaiting burial, I believe? Yes. He's lying in his room. Uh, if I might see? Why, yes, of course. It's the, the first room at the top of the stairs. You'll forgive me if I don't go with you. What, of course. Hastings, you remain here with madame. Do you think Mr. Poirot will understand why I didn't go with him? Oh, I can assure you, Mrs. Maltravers, Poirot is most sympathetic. I don't doubt it, Mr. Hastings. I only wish there was more that I could tell him. Oh, I understand. But I wonder, Mrs. Maltravers, if you could tell me one thing. Oh, well, yes? Well, the station master, an odd character named Volk, said something about Marsden Manor being haunted. Marsden Manor haunted? Why, surely you're joking, Mr. Hastings. Oh, no, no, I assure you. He told us that people have seen things. We must have been referring to my my humble experiments in extrasensory perception. 
I've always been tremendously intrigued by that subject. And doubtless some of our servants have been gossiping. Madame, you are mediumistic. How fascinating. Oh, I wouldn't go so far as to say that, Mr. Poirot. I've dabbled a bit, that's all. So? I've managed uh, table levitation and simple things like that. Hmm. But I suppose to the simple rustics around here, it looks like black magic. Very interesting. Under kinder circumstances, I would implore a demonstration. Why, are you interested in such things, Mr. Poirot? All fields of knowledge interest the great Poirot. Uh, Poirot, don't you think perhaps we'd better... Oh, I, I forgot, madame. Uh, I thank you for your so great courtesy. I do not think you need be bothered any further by the matter. Uh, by the way, do you know anything of your husband's financial position? Nothing, whatever, I'm afraid. I'm very stupid about business. I see. Then you can give us no clue as to why your husband suddenly decided to insure his life. Oh, was it sudden? I'm sure I don't know. Enfin. And now, with your permission, madame, we will go. Hastings? Oh, uh, I'll see you to the door. Merci. Oh, uh, just one more thing, madame. Could you tell me, when they found Mr. Maltravers, did they find him unshod uh, without the shoes? Why, really, Mr. Poirot, I, I don't understand. <laughs> it is nothing. It does not matter. And now, madame, adieu. Oh, but look, you have another visitor. Someone is coming up to walk, huh? Archie! Hello, you! Why, I, I thought you were on your way there to Australia. Yes, I was. But I read the news of Uncle's death in Paris and hurried back. Emily, my dear, is there anything I can do for you? Anything? Oh, of course not. What could you do? Oh, I'm sorry, I'm forgetting. Uh, Mr. Poirot, this is Captain Black, my husband's nephew. Uh, Captain Black, Mr. Hastings. How do you Emily, how did this happen? Uncle seemed perfectly well when I was here Monday night. You've evidently read the papers, Archie. You must know what happened. But they gave no details, just the bare notice of his death. What happened? Archie, I... I just can't go through all that again. Yes, Captain Black, I'm afraid my friend and I, we have disturbed, madame. What are you doing here? I am Hercule Poirot. The Hercule Poirot. Uh, Mr. Poirot is from the insurance company, Archie. That's just why I've come back. To protect you from annoyances like you this. You shouldn't have risked your job, Archie. I if you left right away, you might still get to Paris in time to make your boat train. Uh, you say Paris, mon capitaine. You go to Australia by way of Paris? Why, yes. I intended taking the Orient Express from there and pick up the Pacific Mail at Port Said. Ah, oui. That shortens the journey, does it not? You are staying here, Captain Black? Yes, I'm staying at the Pig and Thistle. That's the inn down in the village. Ah, village inn. It serves the roast beef, no? <laughs> Why, yes, I suppose so. Good. So, Hastings, let us try this roast beef at the Pig and Thistle, huh? Poirot, now you've had your roast beef. Hadn't we better be getting back to London? No, not so fast, my good Hastings. London, she will not run away. But this Captain Black, he may do so. A garçon, garçon. For heaven's sake, Poirot. English inns don't have garçons. No? Then who is it who approaches? Warrior, Cavani. For my friend, the dictionary. For me, a, a, a buck. <laughs> he means beer, George. I mean the ale. Right, oh, Cavani. Uh, you've been up at the manor, sir? I. I mean, yes, we have. We yes, sad business, that. I knew no good had come of it as soon as they took the man, eh? Uh, you mean this, uh, Maltravers? Uh, they were not popular? Well, uh, not that, Governor. He was a bit too old for her, if you know what I mean. Oh, awesome. hmm. She might better have married the nephew. At least, ways on. I'll better Bob than ever you thought, sir. Ah, there has been the gossip, eh? Huh? Oh, I wouldn't go so far as that, Governor. But he did hang around a bit. And the husband, uh, Mr. Maltravers? He object? Not as I knows of, Gaffney. But I is my opinion, I ain't. Mm. Without the doubt, it is the worst opinion, no, George? But, ah, the Captain Black, here he comes now. Hello, Poirot, here you are. Uh, Captain Black, uh, come, will you not join us? Uh, a buck, perhaps? Yes, thanks, I don't mind if I do. Wait, a mug of ale. Oh, hello, Gaffney. Sad business, this death of your uncle, eh? Huh? Yes, and so sudden, too. He seemed in excellent health when I dined with him Monday night. So? And was he also in good spirits? What did he say? Or what was the talk at this dinner Monday night? Oh, I don't know the usual general topics. I see. 
My uncle asked about my people. We talked of Australia. Yes. Then Mrs. Maltravers asked a lot of questions about East Africa, where I've spent some time. I told them one or two yarns. That's about all, I think. Madame Maltravers uh, seems much upset at the death of her husband, no? Naturally. They've been married less than a year. So I hear. A remarkable woman, this lady. Remarkable in what way? What do you mean? She has, uh, how you say, the seeing eye. I hear her tell Hastings she does the séance. He seems most interested, no, Hastings? Oh, I, I wouldn't go so far as that. Uh, always the conservative Hastings. Me, I am not so. Why, well, Mr. Poirot, don't tell me you believe in this psychic stuff. Oh, I have not the closed mind. For example, Captain Black, you have told us all that your conscious self knows. Now, with your permission, I would question your... Subconscious, huh? Psychoanalysis, eh? Well, it's nonsense, but I don't mind. Merci. It is like this. I give you a word. You answer with another word. Any word. The first word you think of. Eh bien. Shall we begin? Go ahead. Hey, Stings, note yeah. down the words, please. Oh, very well, uh -huh. Now. Day. Night. Name. Place. Bernard. Sure. Monday. Dinner. Journey. Ship. Country. Uganda. Story. Lions. Bird gun. Farm. Shot. Suicide. Elephant. Tusks. Money. Lawyers. So, that is all. You are a good subject, mon capitaine. You don't mean to tell me that rigmarole means anything to you? Maybe not. But nevertheless, you are a good subject. <laughs> Well, if you don't need me any more, I think I'll go upstairs and unpack. Shall I see you again before you leave, Mr. Poirot? Yes, I should not be surprised. Good. See you later. Au revoir, mon capitaine. And now, my clever instincts, you see it all, no? Oh, I don't know what you mean, Poirot. Does that list of words tell you nothing? Uh, sorry, I'm afraid it doesn't. Then I will assist you. To begin with, the capitaine answered within the time limit. No pauses, no making up the mind. Uh -huh. Day to night and place to name are normal associations. Then I give him Bernard, the name of the doctor, if he knew him. Oh. Evidently he does not. When I say Bernard, he says sure. Monday means dinner, country is Uganda. Story recalls the lion story, he tells them. All uh, natural. But now, notice. When I mention bird gun, I get the unexpected answer, farm. When I say shot, he answers at once. Suicide. A man he knows commits suicide with a bird gun on a farm somewhere. The imbecile that I am! The great Hercule Poirot is, is hoodwinked. What are you talking about? Do you not see Hastings? That is the story the Captain Black told at the dinner Monday night. Oh, I see. And you think that gave Maltravers the idea? You think he shot himself in the mouth with that bird gun? Why not? Remember, the bird gun has a very tiny charge of powder. The bullet would remain lodged in the brain. All that would show would be the blood in the mouth. Come, Hastings. It is not too late. Of course, but, but where? To see once more this dead man. To Marsdon Manor. Hastings, to Marsdon Manor. <laughs> Alas, Mrs. Maltravers, it is true. Your husband shot himself through the mouth with the bird gun. You mean suicide? It would seem so, madame. But the insurance... Naturally, madame, the suicide will void the policy. It is unfortunate, but <laughs> what will you? Oh, but this is impossible. My husband would never commit suicide. It's, it's inconceivable. But the evidence, madame, it is conclusive. No. There must be some other explanation. You mean uh, murder, madame? Well, of course, that is always possible. But no, no, not likely, I'm afraid. But you do admit it's possible. You just said it was possible. Yes, of course, everything is possible. Have you any idea who might have wished to kill your husband? Why... No. No, I haven't. Madame, I have a suggestion. It is bizarre, no doubt, but perhaps if you are willing to help. Oh, yes, yes, of course, anything. Madame, 
You are mediumistic. Perhaps if you would try, Perhaps you could... Perhaps you're right. Perhaps I could get through to Richard. He might tell us what happened. I am sure you could do it, madame. Yes, yes, I'll do it. Uh, come back here tonight at eight and bring Captain Black with you. Eh bien, madame, I am sure you will succeed. Until late, madame, au revoir. Madame Atroverse, we are on time, as you see. Hastings and I have brought Captain Black with us. I say, there's a bad storm coming up. Would that interfere with the experiment? Certainly not, Mr. Hastings. This isn't mumbo-jumbo. The weather has nothing to do with it. Well, well. Let us proceed, huh? Uh, yes, yes. Now, uh, will you draw chairs up around this table, please? Uh, now, Mr. Hastings, if you'll put out the lights. Certainly. Now, remain perfectly quiet, please, no matter what you hear or see. Richard. Richard. Can you hear me, Richard? Can you hear me? If you can, rap. Rap three Times. Did you hear that? Ah, but of course, madame. Did you not tell him to rap every time? That's how Richard always used to knock. Perhaps he is outside. No. They say the suicide never rests, always returns. Listen. What was that? The front door slammed. What? No, Captain Black. It was but the thunder. Where are I? I hear footsteps. It's the wind, madame. I will close the door. Ah, I have locked it. Uh, don't do that. If it should open now. I hope it is open. He's there. There in the doorway. I see nothing, madame. I saw him, I tell you. My husband, you must have seen him too. Look. She's right. He is there. His hand. Look, it's pointing. What's that light coming from? It's pointing at her. What did you? Her hand. Her right hand. It is scarlet with blood. Blood. Yes, it's blood. I killed him. I said, take it away. Take it away. Light. Good heavens, Poro. She's got away through that window. Do not worry, mon capitaine. The good inspector Jap outside will stop her. Good heavens, that. That lovely creature, a murderer. And a very clever one, my susceptible Hastings. After all, she could not know she would come up against the great Hercule Poirot. And she might even have fooled me if she had only taken off his shoe. His shoe, Poirot? Only with his toe could he himself have pulled the trigger of this bird gun. And par bleu, his shoes were still on when they found him. But I don't understand. This seance, was it all fake? Mais certainement. She meant to pull the sheep. Ah, wool. Oh, very well, wool. 
But it was I who pulled the sheep's wool over her eyes. Thanks to my good friend Henri Dubois, who played the part of the husband's ghost, and Papa Poirot, who put the red paint on her hand in the dark. But what was her idea in having this séance? Parbleu, mon capitaine, do you not see? Madame, she will go into the trance. She will hear the voice. She will come out from the trance. She will, with the great reluctance, name the murderer. You mean she meant to confess? Mais non, mon capitaine. She meant to name you. You have been listening to Murder Clinic. Murder Clinic, the WOR Mutual Series, which brings to you each week one exciting case. Tonight, the tragedy of Marsden Manor, with Agatha Christie's unique detective, Hercule Poirot, played by Maurice Tottenham. Next week, Murder Clinic will bring you Fred Irving Anderson's Deputy Farr, the Vermont farmer who became chief of the Homicide Bureau in New York City. Deputy Parr, the man with the nose for murder. The story is Gulfstream Green, in which the deputy proves that the conceit of murderers is colossal. Original music was composed by Ralph Barnhart and conducted by Bob Stanley. This program was an international exchange feature over the coast-to-coast -coast network of the Canadian Broadcasting Corporation. Tales told on Murder Clinic are adaptations by authors Lee Wright and John A. Bassett. Murder Clinic is produced under the direction of Alvin Flanagan. Frank Knight speaking. Weird Darkness is celebrating its ninth birthday this month, and we mark that on our calendars by holding a fundraiser each year in October. We raise money for organizations that help people who struggle with depression, anxiety, and thoughts of suicide and self-harm. It's called Overcoming the Darkness, and you can make a donation right now at WeirdDarkness.com slash Overcoming. That's WeirdDarkness.com slash Overcoming. A gift of any amount will bring us that much closer to our goal of $5,000, and every dollar you give helps someone affected by depression, so no gift is too small. You can help us celebrate the podcast's birthday, celebrate the darkness of Halloween, and also help people climb out of the darkness that they're trapped in. To donate or get more information about overcoming the darkness and watch a video I created about it, visit WeirdDarkness.com slash Overcoming. The fundraiser ends Halloween night at midnight, so please, give right now while you're thinking about it. That's WeirdDarkness.com slash Overcoming. Like a madman who wants to kill me. Someone does. Like the other three, flying on the floor in a pool of blood. Almost twelve o'clock. Night. Any minute now, there'll be a ring. Or a knock. <laughs> Midnight. The witching hour when the night is darkest. Our fear is the strongest. And our strength at its lowest ebb. Midnight. When the graves gape open and the death strikes. How? You'll learn the answer in just a minute in The Creeper. <laughs> Now, Murder at Midnight, 
On this program, we bring you the best and most blood-curdling stories ever written. And so now we bring you a tale which you may have heard before. A tale which we consider a classic in terror and suspense. The Creeper by Joseph Ruskall. In the kitchenette of the New York apartment, the man and his wife listened to the evening news broadcast. New York. The unknown killer called the Creeper has struck again adding a third female corpse to his toll. Mm. Virginia Peters, a comely waitress, was found strangled to death in her third-floor apartment early this morning while her radio blared. As in the previous murders, a note was found scrawled on the wall with the victim's lipstick and the plea, for heaven's sake, catch me before I kill more. I cannot control myself. Oh. Police insist... Now, why'd you turn it off? Oh, how awful. Also, and in this very neighborhood. Let's hear the rest. It's very interesting. Oh, you don't go turning that radio on again, Steve Grant. Heard enough, I'll go out of my mind, for heaven's sake. That's it. A good, solid clue. What is? For heaven's sake. How many men ever use that expression? Oh, shut up. Okay, Mrs. Grant, pass the biscuits, my little pigeon. Pass the biscuits, E, D, D. Three women in three days murdered in cold blood by a mad scene right here in Washington Heights. I'm too sick to go out, too scared to stay in. The lock's broke. He sits there eating, 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 past the biscuit. There's nothing wrong with my appetite, my love. Of course. That's what costs you your job on the police force. When I even think of... Some men drink to escape. I eat. Escape what? What? An ugly tongue, a beautiful face, and a roving eye. In short, a wife. Oh, so you're starting that again, you and your crazy jealousy. Yeah, maybe that's the creeper's way of escaping, too, Georgia. Who knows? Go ahead and get a divorce. Go ahead. Can I help it if men look at me? Uh. I don't know why you come home at all. Where do you go? What do you do with yourself? Where were you this morning? Why'd you come back? To eat. But someday I'll lose my appetite for that, too. And when I do, my dear, there'll be no escape. And now I'm off again. Just... <coughs> Still using stage lipstick. Wipe it off. How many times must I tell you? You're married now, remember? Steve, wait. Yeah? At least go buy my medicine. Sorry, I got no time. Don't leave me here alone. Stay home this evening. Please, I'm afraid. Oh, don't be silly, pet. Nothing will happen to you. You got a doorman here, an elevator boy, Mrs. Stone across the hall, a phone. You're safe enough. But the night lock, it doesn't work. <laughs> oh, now you can't lock me out anymore. It doesn't catch. Something's happened to it since last night. Steve. Get a new one. I can't get a locksmith. I've tried all day. Steve, please. If I want to phone you, where will you be? Out. Goodbye. Take care of your call. Steve Grant. Huh? Well, if it isn't all pearly chase, how are you? Here you got thrown off the force, Steve. Yeah, I hear you got thrown off the news, Pearly. You heard wrong. I wasn't fired. I was just warned. I wasn't fired either. Just suspended for three days. Eating a lamb chop at Casey's when I should have been ringing in from the box at 162nd with all that trouble up there. On my way to headquarters now for reinstatement. I eat too much, my trouble is. I drink too much. I hear you're living up at the Heights, Steve. Yeah. That's funny, me too. Yeah? Hear you're married now to a beautiful and lovely young... With admiration. <laughs> Say it again. I think I knew her. Wasn't her stage name Georgia Dixon? Yeah, that's her. I love that wench with you. Ah, uh, women. How does a guy handle him? You know, maybe the creeper has the right man. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you for taking the words out of my mouth. Who's the creeper, Steve? Any angles? You tell me and I'll split the reward with you. <laughs> <laughs> Say... What do you think of Inspector Bradley's inside job here? Uh, nuts. Every janitor is a creeper? And as for that doorman, Jim Ellis, is because he worked at two of the three murder apartments? Pure coincidence. Anyway, they've released him. One thing, though, and I don't think even Bradley's put it together yet. Huh? Eh? In all three cases, just before the creeper struck, the door locks had already been tampered with. You don't say. You got a theory? Well, sure. I mean, uh, you take that note on the wall. For heaven's sake, in every case, for heaven's sake, catch me before I kill more. I cannot control myself. Right. Oh. Now, what man uses an expression like that? You want the lowdown? It's just this. A creeper is a woman. 
<laughs> a gimmick, huh? Yeah. Like the height of the message from the floor is a trick, six feet. And yet I'll lay odds the creeper's no more than a guy your height, say, or mine. Five nine, just like us, you or me. Only great. Huh? How do you figure that? How do I figure lots of things? How do I know where the creeper's gonna strike next? You do? Certainly. The creeper's not so smart, he's just crazy. You play along crazy and you're one jump ahead of him. That's the trouble with Inspector Bradley, why he's up a tree. You expect logical clues from a madman? You play along crazy, make out you're the creeper. And what do you get? Well, go ahead, let's see. All right, the victims are all redheads, every one. You've noticed that, of course. Three in three days? Yeah, now that you mentioned They it. all lived in the Heights, right? Agnes Martin, Jane Krutsky, Virginia Peters? Right. Mm -hmm. What was the number of the apartment in each case? Agnes lived in 1A, Jane 2B, Virginia 3C. Don't ask me the why or wherefore. Don't ask me the logic. Just play along crazy, see what I mean? Where's he going to strike next? Huh? I don't get you. The next victim of the creeper also lives in the Heights. She's a redhead. Her nightlock's been tampered with. She's going to get hers today in her apartment number's 4D. Well, why are you looking at me? Don't you like my arithmetic? Curly, my wife's a redhead. We live in the Heights. And our apartment number is... <laughs> You're just a boozy reporter. Your apartment number? 4D, I told you. 4D, of course. It's pretty late, but I'll have it delivered. I was busy admiring your lipstick, Mrs. Grant. I have nothing like it in stock. 4D, I should have guessed it anyway. Why? Well, a face is a number. Believe me, since you've moved into the neighborhood, Mrs. Grant... For me, it has a special number, like uh, Double Dandy Delicious Dream. <laughs> Four Ds, you see? Uh, go on. They should tell that to every customer. Female. I'm a ladies' man? Like the creeper? <laughs> what did I say? What's going on in this block? Raw nerves, you can't joke. The creeper, the creeper, that's all I hear all day. It's mass hysteria. There ain't such an animal. Do you... You don't think so? I assure you, Mrs. Grant, it's a fairy tale for circulation of the tabloids. I'll send you a prescription up with the boy. No, uh, no I'll, I'll, I'll just wait here for... Well, it'll take some time. You should go right home and stay there if you're just getting over the flu. I'll tell you what. I'll deliver it myself. It'll be a flu. No, 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 I'll, I'll wait. I, I may not go right back. I don't want to... I want to be there alone. I'm afraid. Very well. Suit yourself. And have a seat. <laughs> for heaven's sake, stop me before I kill... <laughs> I cannot control my... Hey, I was only joking, Mrs. Grant. Wait, Mrs. Grant, you Mrs. Grant. Oh, Mrs. Grant. Oh, oh. oh. <laughs> you, Mrs. Stone. Why, yes, what's your hurry here? I just got such a scare. Since these awful murders in this neighborhood. Yes, isn't it terrible? Oh, I'm simply frightened to death myself. You walking home? Yeah, I guess so, but I'll go with you. It's good we live in the same house. At least if I had a double lock, but the night one doesn't work. Oh, really? Well, I have a chain lock besides and still. Oh, it I... is. I sit and shiver when there's a sound at the door. Can't get a locksmith. Tried all day, but they're all so busy. Mr. Frank on the corner promised to, but didn't know when. Why are they all so busy? Oh, my dear. Because every woman in the neighborhood's changing theirs, too simply a nightmare. Oh, but don't you worry. We'll stay together this evening. Mr. Stone's out, too. Think of it, we've never visited, though we live right across the hall from each other. Isn't that like a big city, for heaven's sake? Or would you rather I dropped in on you? Well, uh, I, I don't well, know. Well, your place, then. Isn't that horrible, the ghastly things they're saying? The theories one doesn't know what to think next. You believe the latest? The latest? That maybe it's a woman? The creeper? <laughs> A woman? Can you beat it? I just can't imagine how in the world the police figure that, for heaven's sake. Can you? I say, can you, Miss Grant? Oh, I don't know. I, I was just thinking of something like... So I can see where a married woman now, if her husband was faithless, well, I can understand such a theory because... Well, you take my husband now. You've met Mr. Stone, haven't you? Oh, well, Mrs. Grant, why on earth you're staring at me like that, for heaven's sake? Oh, I uh, don't feel well. I must get home. I uh, feel sleepy. Mrs. Grant! 
Sobbing <laughs> 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 with terror, a woman with red hair runs up the dark street, back to her apartment on the door with the broken lock. There's the hand of the clock to move on towards 12 o'clock and... Murder! At midnight. And now, back to Murder at Midnight and The Creeper. Back to Georgia Grant, hurrying hysterically through the dark streets. Where's the apartment with the broken lock on the door? Good evening, ma'am. Out late, aren't you? Oh. Yeah, you're the uh, new doorman? Just relieving Charlie. Nice night. Yeah, yeah it was very nice. Here, uh, let me ring the elevator for you. No, no, not to trouble. No trouble, ma'am. There. Apartment 4D, huh? Uh, yeah. How did you know? Doesn't take long. When will this elevator come? Coming now. Terrible things, ma'am. The happenings. What? The creeper. It's still... Oh. It's going up? Yeah, yeah. Up and down, up and down. The ups and downs are life, that's me. I'm a living milkshake, Mrs. Grant. Uh-oh. What's wrong, Jimmy? Stuck. Imagine getting stuck between a third and fourth with a production like you. Get going, Sonny. Want me to report you? Okay, okay. Can't you take a joke? <laughs> Maybe I misconstrued that smile you always give me. Maybe you shouldn't order to smile that way. Fourth floor. Let me out. If I drop in later, will you be more receptive? <laughs> oh. Home. Oh, thank goodness. I'm be going out of my mind. Key. Where's my key? Darn this lock. Darn the lock. Is the locksmith in yet? Well, I want to know how soon I can get my lock changed. Yes, I know it's late, but he promised. This is Mrs. Grant. Yes, 4D, yes. I know you just explained to me, but I must... Georgia? Yes? Yes, so, so won't you... I've please? been waiting for you. Oh, oh, oh. Don't you little fool, it's me. Do you want the whole house to... That's better. What are you doing here? Oh, don't worry. You haven't got a thing to worry about now. I've come to protect you. Give me the phone. Hello? Never mind about the lock, thank you. Sit down. Make yourself at home. Been waiting here for you. Long time no see, Georgia. What do you want, Pearly? Me? A headline. Your husband wants to. He wants I should keep an eye on you. What's that? Sure. You didn't think Steve and I were acquainted, did you? Oh, yes. From way back. This met him at a bar. I don't believe you. What do you mean, keep an eye on me? Oh, just in case the creep... <laughs> <laughs> you heard of the character? You're mad. You've always been mad, Pearly Chase. Where is Steve? Why should he send you here? Why should he think the creeper will come here? What are you doing here? Told you. Playing along crazy. Got a drink? You're drunk now. And you're getting right out of here. You're nothing but a no-good rummy. And you're nothing but a no-good... You finish it. When I took the drink, it was to drown you out. And you know it. I'm still a rum pot angel. Which means I haven't got rid of you. Yet. Get out. You're a little two-time and redhead. You're all the same, you redheads. Even a wedding ring you can't change you. Oh, uh, right. don't play the innocent. My business is snooping. I make a living at it. Between drinks. 
So your new motto's love thy neighbor. Oh, huh? Mr. Stone across the hall? Poor dumb Steve. I'm warning you, get out or I'll call the police. Stay where you are. Oh, right, really? What are you doing with that gun? I wouldn't pick up that phone if I were you. You see, there's a big reward for the creeper and a heck of an exclusive, and I don't want to share it. I'm riding a hunch. Now, sit down, darling. Just play along with me while I play along crazy. Sit down. That's <laughs> it. Uh, like we're expecting company. <laughs> let's have some music. Don't just sit. Let's have some music. I said turn on the radio. That's it. That's the good girl. Ah, dance music. Ah, let's dance. Give me your room. Let's dance. Like old times. Around and around like my brain. Why are you trembling? I still love you, you little fool. Ask me why. I love you. I love you, you lovely redhead. I could kill you and you deserve it. With the radio on, you could scream and no one is here. I could tip my hand on your throat like this and I could scream. Why are you crying? Stop it. I'm here to protect you. Stop crying. Cut it, I say. Cut it out. I can't stand it. I never could. Okay. You want me to leave? All right, I will. It's your funeral. What am I saving you for anyway? Where's my hat? In a few minutes, there'll be a knock or a ring or the door will just open. And you'll be lying in a pool of blood like the other three. Goodbye, my worthless. Give my regards to the creep. <laughs> Listen, what if he comes back? He wants to kill me, wants to kill me, somebody wants to kill me. I must lie down. My head is splitting. Uh, trying to frighten me, still a spite, that's it. Like the other three. In a pool of blood. Like the other three. Like the other three. Almost. Almost twelve o'clock. Any minute now there will be a knock. Or a ring. Ah. <laughs> yes? This is the doorman, Mrs. Grant. Yes? The druggist is here with the medicine. Shall I let him up? The medicine? Oh, yes, let it. No, 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 no. Don't let that man up. Want me to bring it up? No, 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 no. I'm perfectly all right. I don't need any. I don't need it, you hear? Don't you dare come up. Don't dare me. <laughs> oh, please, please. I must have it changed right away. My lock, my door lock. Yes, this is Mrs. Grant. Yes, I do want it. Of course, anyone can get in, anyone. They want to murder me, but I don't know who. It's the creeper. Will you come right away? Thank you, thank you. Thank you so much, but hurry. Please hurry or I'll go out of my mind. Oh, thank the Lord. Thank the Lord. Like the other three, you know. Pool of blood. Any minute now, a knock or a ring. <laughs> Who? Who's there? It's me, dear, Mrs. Stone. Oh, what do you want? Well, I've been worried about you. Are you ill? No, I'm all right, Mrs. Stone. I'm feeling fine. Oh, well, up, dear. Don't you want me to keep you company? No, 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 thank you. I, I was just... Oh, stop that. Do listen in, silly and weird. No, no, please, go away. I'm going to sleep. Go away. Do you hear me? Go away! Oh. Hello. Hello, George. Are you oh. all right? Oh, Steve. Steve, I've been frantic. So good to hear your voice. 
Where are you? At headquarters. I'm coming right home. Sweetheart, is anything wrong? You... No, 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 not now. Not when I hear you, Steve. I don't know what came over me all day. I've been imagining things. So silly. My nerves. Sorry about the supper tonight, honey. I wasn't myself. My job had me down, but now everything... Oh, of course. Forgive me, Steve. I've been bad, bad, wicked. Oh, darling, if you knew what I've gone through tonight, the most dreadful state. And then that... Steve, did you send someone here today? Curly Chase? Then you did? Yeah, to keep me company. Isn't he still with you? No, I just got rid of him. Oh, I wish you hadn't. He's an all right guy. Smart reporter. Lives in the neighborhood, too. Honey, it sounds cockeyed. I mean, pearly theory. But I was kind of worried when I got to thinking, so... Listen, Georgia. Yes? Don't let anyone in the house till I get home. No, no, I won't, Steve. Not anyone, do you hear? Not anyone. Oh, uh, uh, Steve, wait. What? Uh, wait, Steve, it's... Uh, thank goodness at last now I can breathe easy. Darling, just a minute. Georgia. Hello. Hello, George. Mr. Frank? Mr. Frank. Did you hear me? Thank goodness you've come. Please, step in. It's uh, the lock on this door. I want... Just a moment. My, my husband's on the phone. Steve? Yeah, what happened? There was something else I wanted to tell It's all right, darling. Everything's all right now, Steve. You needn't worry. Didn't I just hear you talking to someone? Was that somebody at the door? No, it's no one, dear. Just M Mr. Frank, the locksmith. What a load. Georgia, listen. Listen, Georgia. That's what I was going to tell you. What is... The police are on a new trail. They think maybe a locksmith. Georgia, you listening? They think maybe the creeper's a locksmith. Oh. Get him out, quick. What nice lipstick you need, Mrs. Yes. Georgia. Very nice lipstick. Very nice lipstick. Georgia. Hello, Georgia. Hello. Hurry, catch me before I kill more, for heaven's sake. Soft footsteps hurrying down the corridor, away from the door with a broken lock, now standing ajar, the body of a red-headed woman. And still, should she not have known that her only visitor would be death, the clocks struck twelve for... Remember to be with us again when death knocks at the door, wearing a familiar face. And the clocks strike twelve for murder at midnight. The part of Georgia was played by Ann Shepard. With music by Charles Paul, Murder at Midnight was directed by Anton M. Leader. This is Orson Welles, speaking from London. The Black Museum, it's a repository of death. Here in the grimy stone structure on the Thames, which houses Scotland Yard, is a warehouse of homicide. Where everyday objects, a phonograph record, a postcard, a color photograph, a simple statuette, all are touched by murder.
had two scribbled notes. Bits of paper with three words scrawled across them. Slogan known around the world, a slogan you recognize. Words created in the kind of lonely, fond men far from home, men at war, have enjoyed through all of history. What's it mean, Inspector? It would be nice to know, Sergeant. I suspect that if we did know, we'd have the answer to this nasty business. Well, this killer, sir, it's possible he's an American. That phrase was American, sir, all through the war. Kilroy was here. Kilroy was here. And he's still here. In the Black Museum. From the annals of the Criminal Investigation Department of the London Police... We bring you the dramatic stories of the crimes recorded by the objects in Scotland Yard's Gallery of Death, the Black Museum. Well, here we are in the Black Museum. Scotland Yard's Museum of Murder. Here's a typewriter. Your secretary uses one. Perhaps your son or daughter write their school essays on a machine like this. This one is used to write a letter. That letter brought a woman to an address and death to the author of that letter. Now, here are the notes. Scrawled on line paper such as children use, children who are just learning to write. And a photograph showing the same three words scratched on a wooden surface. Three times three was a number in witchcraft in ancient times. Three times three words were written. This wasn't witchcraft. Merely murder. Began for Inspector Liggett and Sergeant Porter in the usual manner. A telephone rang in the inspector's office at the yard. Inspector Liggett here. Sergeant Garth, 11th District Metropolitan Police, sir. We're at the Royal Roost, sir. Private Supper Club, 15 Marley Court. The proprietor, Matt Bolton, has been shot and killed, Inspector. Very well, we'll be right along. Well, ah, so Matt Bolton has finally departed this earth, Porter. In the expected manner? In the expected manner. You wouldn't know Matt Bolton. 99 chances out of 100, you never heard of him. But enough people had heard of him to net Matt Bolton a neat six-figure income from various protective associations and entertainment enterprises, such as the Royal Roost, one of those small private supper clubs, manages to keep its license by operating just within the law. The club was easy to find. In place of a neon sign, there was a police constable at the door. Yeah, it looks like it's this way, I think. Yes. Coffee in here, Inspector? It always is in these places. Apparently a good many people prefer to amuse themselves breathing a combination of tobacco and poor liquor fumes rather than good fresh air. Quite a costume on those girls. Mm -hmm. Roosters in the Royal Rooster. <laughs> Get it, Sergeant? <laughs> I've never seen a rooster with so little on besides tail feathers. And I don't know why. Yep, look, we better get to work, Sergeant. The two policemen crossed the nightclub, skirted the dance floor, and quietly passed through the doorway near the bandstand. To their left, another door stood open, revealing a cubicle complete with mirror lights, another girlish rooster, a man, and a body. A body full length on the floor. The girl was saying... Look, we simply can't send a chorus out once more. Do I get to do my act or don't I? I'm Inspector Liggett, Sergeant. The young lady may uh, uh, do her act. I doubt if she'll try to go outside the club in that, mm. that costume. Well, thank you, Inspector. First, this man said he thought the show ought to go on so the customers wouldn't be disturbed, and then he held me here. Oh, look, that's my cue. I'll be back. Don't worry, I'm not going any place. You're so right about that, Inspector. There was a way around that girl, sir. Found the body, didn't turn her hair. So I noticed. Find the weapon, Sergeant? No, sir, not in here. Uh, Porter, check the exits. Very good, sir. Oh, we've done that, sir. Only two, the way you came and the back door, fire exit. No one in the kitchen saw or heard anything. We haven't touched the body. Waited for you and the medical examiner, sir. Uh, very good. All right. 
Turn out his pockets, Porter. Yes, sir. Here's something, Inspector. Tucked in his breast pocket. Yeah. Hmm. Quite a touch. I, uh, I take it you didn't see this, Garth? No, sir. We left the body strictly as it was. Odd. Almost a signature. It's a note. Kilroy was here. For a moment, memories of other days crowded into the tiny dressing room. A phrase which had meant chuckles once seemed incongruous in that atmosphere of violent death. And then Mabel was back with boyfriend. May I inquire who your escort is, Miss Martin? Larry King meets Scotland Yard. Gentlemen, how do you do? Is this your usual practice, Mr. King? If you mean escorting Miss Martin home, that's correct. You are uh, good friends? We're engaged. I see. Uh, Miss Martin, before you leave us to get, uh, get dressed, uh, uh, during your employment here, have you ever had any, uh, any trouble with Mr. Bolton? Do you mean, did he make advances? Yes. Well, naturally. I see. Uh, Mr. King, did you know about these, uh, these advances? I did. Did you ever have any trouble with Mr. Bolton? Nothing to speak of? Of course, it never is anything to speak of. You served during the recent war. I did. Eighth Army. All the way from Tobruk to Northern Italy. Does the expression Kilroy was here mean anything to you? The Americans. Fifth Army, they used it. I've seen it many times. Oh, very well. Uh, leave your addresses, both of you, with Sergeant Garth here. And uh, don't leave the city. We may need you. That's all for now. Now the routine begins. Inspector Liggett and Sergeant Porter return to the yard. The orders go out. Have them run a complete check on Bolton's pals. They'll all have alibis, but run the check anyway. That was a start. Now the patient waiting, putting together the few facts available. It's the hardest part of police work anywhere. So, Porter, hmm. no prints on that note except... Yours and mine. Correct, Inspector. What do you got on King and the girl? She's, uh, well, remarkably respectable. Mm, nothing remarkable, Sergeant. Uh, what about him? He's a lawyer in the city. Rather successful. Good reputation. Mm, ever crossed Bolton's path in his work? Nope. He's a copyright lawyer. Deals with writers, mostly. Uh, nothing there, then. Takes patience. Lots of it. Check and recheck. Wait for information. Wait for the telephone to ring. Inspector Liggett here. Yeah? Detective Ashton, sir. 23rd District. Uh, go ahead, Ashton. At 14 and a half Haven Mew, sir. We've been watching the place, sir. That King fellow lives there. Yes, I know. The superintendent's wife has been found, sir, on the cellar steps, strangled. We found a note in her apron pocket. Kilroy was here, it says. Wait for the telephone to ring, and when it does ring... Another death, another note, no solution. Merely complication piled on complication. A short while later in the basement apartment of the newly widowed janitor. You found her yourself, Mr. Evans? Yes, sir. Lying there she was on the cellar steps. I was going down to look at the oil burner. I see. Now, uh, your wife have any enemies, Mr. Evans? No, sir, no. Where would the likes of us come in, having enemies? Quarrelsome a little, you might say. But what woman isn't? Oh, she she quarreled with you? With me, mostly. Not that I could blame her. It's hard work, a place like this, you know. Once in a while with a tenant. Well, the children in 4B, for instance, they write on the walls. So my wife argues with the mother. Mm -hmm. The nice young man in 6G lets the bathtub run over. 5G complains. My wife scolds Mr. King. I see, yes. Now... Is Mr. King at home now? Oh, I believe so, sir. All right. Thank you. We'll do our best to find whoever killed your wife, Mr. Evans. Oh, thank you, sir. She had a temper, I know, but she never did no real harm. Up in the self-service elevator on the sixth floor. Find 6G and ring the bell. Have it open, not by Larry King, but by Mabel Martin. Far more fully dressed than the last time the inspector saw her. Well, uh, Miss Martin, collected the insurance yet? Cut it out, inspector. 
I don't have to stand for that sort of thing. In fact, I could ask you for a warrant before I let you in here. But you won't, will you, Mr. King? Ask your questions. They're about Mrs. Evans, I assume. Oh, Larry, please. Don't worry, darling. Ask your questions, Inspector. You quarreled with Mrs. Evans. I did. I wanted my bathtub fixed. The drain was backing up. She told me to go to fix it myself, that's all. You're sure that was all? Murder seems to have a way of happening in your vicinity, King. Is that an accusation? What's all this to do with Matt Bolton? I don't know. Um, but there is a link. Quite a clear link, Miss Martin. You see, on Mrs. Evans, we found a bit of paper. And on it was scrawled, Kilroy was here. Any ideas on that, ex-soldier, now Solicitor King? Solicitor King had nothing to say. His puzzlement, his lack of knowledge, seemed honest enough. Inspector Leggett drew no conclusions. He waited. The routine continued. The reports came in. The Martin Gettle has a new job. Same type of club. I've seen the act, Inspector. Same songs. More clothes. Nothing on Bolton's cronies. Every one of them has an alibi. Yes. King seems to follow a set routine, Inspector. To the office, back home, dinner, then calls for the girl. Even eats his lunch at the same time, every day in the same restaurant. Nothing much to go on there, just a time of waiting. A week passed. The telephone rang once again. Inspector Liggett here. Detective Ashton, sir. We've another one for you. What? Yes, sir. A butcher this time. Name of Andrews. Two blocks from the apartment house where King lives. Head bashed in with his own mallet. Scratched on the chopping block with one of his own knives. The same old message, sir. Kilroy was here. Kilroy was here. Familiar words with a smile in their words to remember fondly. Three times they appear. On a butcher's block. On scraps of paper. And today... They can be seen in the Black Museum. A third killing, and signed exactly the same way. Kilroy was here. More, this murder had taken place within a few blocks of 14 and a half Haven Mews, where Larry King lived. The same young man who was the secret fiancé of the singer and whose dressing room the first body had been found. The same young man who lived in the house where the janitor's wife had been strangled. Inspector Liggett lost no time reaching the scene of the latest crime. Yes, well, it's... Uh, yes, sir, well, I am... Um, um, <laughs> uh, Ashton. Uh, yes, sir. Uh, anything fresh? Just the things I reported, sir. There's the mallet... The weapon? Yeah. The message was scratched with this knife. Mm. Uh, any prints? Uh, the laboratory crew are trying to raise some. Nothing yet. Uh, very well. Uh, who's the woman? The widow. Uh, Mrs. Andrews, I, I really dislike bothering you with questions at this time, but you understand that speed may be the essence now. Yes. Yes, of course, Inspector. Uh, I understand that it was you who found your husband. Yes. I stopped here to get some money for a dress. It'll have to be a black one now. Did you always come to him for that kind of money? Well, Jim had his ways. He, he was considerably older than I am. He seemed just strong when we first married. But, well, later he was... Well, it changed to domineering. I understand, but now look, just a few more questions, please. Does the phrase on the chopping block mean anything to you? Kilroy was here? No. No, it's... Well, it's just a... Well, I think I heard it on the radio once or twice. From the way you described your husband, I'd say he was rather, well, positive in his opinion. A mild way of putting it. Positive. Domineering, a man who broke no argument. As the questions went on, the picture became more clear of a large, almost brutish man who covered his deficiencies with bluster and bullying. Finally... Uh, just one more point, Mrs. Andrews. Did your husband ever argue with his customers? I mean, uh, did he make any enemies among them? Well, some. Only over little things. Can you give me a specific instance? Well, 
Last week. Mm-hmm. Yes, it was last week. A, a nice young man said Jim was overcharging him. They had words. The man, his name is Larry King, from the apartment house on Haven Mews, he, he swore he'd never buy here again. I see. Have I, uh, have I helped, Inspector? You may have. Just a little time will tell, I suspect. Just a little time. A little time. Within the hour, Larry King was in custody, taken in charge for 24 hours on suspicion of complicity. His fingerprints revealed... Nothing. His answers to the barrage of questions revealed... Nothing. Wearily, the inspector and Sergeant Porter returned to the office to face unrelated facts and a no-progress report. Wearily, the inspector picked up the receiver of his office intercom. Yes, Sergeant? You have a caller, sir. Who is it? Miss Mabel Martin, sir. She insists on speaking with you. Miss Martin was ushered in, seated in front of the desk. I, uh, uh, I've got something to tell you, Inspector. Uh, please do. Well, Larry didn't kill anybody. Uh, didn't he? No. I did. Steady, Sergeant. Please take down Miss Martin's statement. Now, I must warn you, Miss Martin, anything you say will be taken down in writing and may be used in evidence. Yes, I... I understand. Now the floodgates opened. I killed all three of them and left the notes to make it look as though Larry did it. So simple, so obvious. Matt Bolton threatened me. He said if I didn't come back to him, it, he'd change his insurance policies and, and tell Larry about us. Well, I... I shot him. It was a twenty-two that Larry had given me. One death accounted for... The policeman listened gravely. Mrs. Evans was always snooping. She threatened to tell Larry about Matt and me. I I did it in the cellar, behind the coal pile. I... I strangled her. Quite logical. The inspector waited. Andrews, the butcher, I I used to shop there for Larry. Andrews made some advances. He... He reached for me and... And I I grabbed a meat cleaver. Then I I scratched the note on the wood. That's the story, Inspector. (sighs) Yes. Tell me, how much do you weigh, Miss Martin? Uh, About 107 pounds. Why, what's that got to do with... Uh, Sergeant Porter, Hmm? what was the caliber of the bullet found in Matt Bolton? 138 caliber, sir. Uh, thank you. And did you notice a coal pile in the cellar at 14 and a half Haven Mews? It's an oil burner, sir. Quite modern. Uh, thank you. And the, the weapon in the Andrews case? Uh, a mallet, sir. Not a cleaver. A mallet. And, Sergeant, can you picture a young woman of 107 pounds knocking out and killing a man of Andrews size? Not very well, sir. Of course, it's obvious. Her heart and her courage are as large as she is, if not larger, but... uh... (laughs) Oh, all right, have your fun. I've made a fool of myself, but... But Larry didn't kill anyone. I know that. I know it. You can't do this to Uh, her. Look, look, look. I I, I wouldn't worry, Miss Martin, if I were you. In, In fact, if I were you, I'd hurry out to the front of the building. Mr. King is about to be released, and I think you'll want to meet him there. Won't you? Oh, Inspector. Oh, Sergeant, I... Oh, forgive me, please. <sighs> How about it, Porter? Care to have a girl like that to marry? Yes, sir. For more reasons than one. Where are we now, sir? Oh, Han Porter, I'd say we were just about where we were when we first heard of the Andrews killing... Put on your thinking cap, Sergeant. This is quite a problem. They sat there in silence. Their minds sifted fact after fact. And once they'd been through the meager supply of facts on hand, they started over again. At one point, the inspector said, half to himself, 
There's something we're overlooking. Probably quite a simple point. It usually is, but... Uh... He was quite right. In fact, the inspector was quite appalled. So appalled. He spoke in what amounted to a whisper. Sergeant, hand me that telephone directory, please. What? Oh, yeah, yes, sir. <clears throat> Can I help you, sir? Uh, no, 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 thank you. Um, uh, look, uh, just get your hat, Sergeant. Get my hat. Yes, we are going back to 14 and a half Haven Mews. That's King's address. Yes, and according to the director, it is also the residence of one Joseph Kilroy, one of the seven Kilroys listed in the London telephone directory. Doesn't take long from Scotland Yard to Haven Mews, not when you travel by police car with a siren going. It doesn't take long to race upstairs to a third floor apartment, ring the doorbell. Come in, gentlemen. <laughs> I heard your arrival in the street. What took you so long, gentlemen? <laughs> oh, really, now. Uh, Mr. Kilroy, I must warn you, anything you oh, say... Oh, that's all right. I understand. Don't mind in the least. Well, I'll be... Watch him, Sergeant. I am, sir. Frankly, uh, uh, Liggett. Uh, Inspector Liggett. Oh, yes, thank you. Frankly, Inspector, I'm rather annoyed with you. <laughs> Here I go to all the trouble of killing a man... So that nice young fellow in 6G could marry that cute little baggage he's going with. And you arrest him <laughs> instead of me. I uh, see. I, I'm i sorry about that, too. So, so you killed Bolton. <laughs> Saw him one night treating the girl <laughs> really nastily. In front of his house. If I may ask, why the woman? Oh, she was a nagger. Really annoying. <laughs> and after I killed one, oh, it struck me I couldn't be hanged more than once. So I might as well do old Evans, too. Thoughtful of you, Mr. Kilroy. Mm. That butcher was a private matter, though. Uh. He kicked a dog once. I saw him. Didn't treat his wife any better. No kids. Figured he'd leave her his money. So I got him with his own mallet. <laughs> Quite simple, you see. And uh, you signed your name to each one? Oh, of course. Good deeds are scarce in this world. Thought I ought to get proper credit each time. Now, if you'll excuse me... Sergeant! <coughs> Good work, Sergeant. Uh, he's strong, sir. Stronger than he looks. Cases like this usually are. Ah, uh, well. We'll need the ambulance. Not the wagon this time. And uh, use the telephone director, Sergeant. <laughs> I find them quite useful books. When I remember to use them. Who'd have thought it, sir? How many of our murderers are considerate enough to sign their killings, sir? Murderers don't sign their work, do they? Unless, of course, their sense of humor is as twisted as their valuation of human life. This killer did autograph his killings. And today those notes can be seen in the usual place for such things. In the Black Museum. Joe Kilroy was insane, of course, by every normal standard. Insane enough, certainly, to sign his name to three murders. And by every normal standard, the gentlemen of Scotland Yard acted correctly within the rules of their profession in tracing every possible motivation, every possible suspect, before they came to the obvious solution. After all, it is logical that when men spend their lives dealing with the deliberately obscured, they can actually fail to notice the openly obvious now the notes remain in their usual place in Scotland Yard in the Black Museum. And until we meet again in this same place for another story about the Black Museum, I remain as always obediently yours. Thanks for listening. If you like what you heard, be sure to subscribe so you don't miss future episodes. If you like the show, please share it with someone you know who loves old-time radio or the paranormal or strange stories, true crime, monsters, or unsolved mysteries like you do. You can email me and follow me on social media through the Weird Darkness website. WeirdDarkness.com is also where you can listen to free audiobooks I've narrated, 
Get the email newsletter, visit the store for creepy and cool Weird Darkness merchandise, you can find other podcasts that I host. Plus, it's where you can find the Hope in the Darkness page if you or someone you know is struggling with depression, addiction, or thoughts of harming yourself or others. You can find all of that and more at WeirdDarkness.com. I'm Darren Marlar. Thanks for joining me for this episode of Weird Darkness's Retro Radio.